If you ever wondered how Krishnan Kualamagi turned five grand into a hundred million dollars and you want to go deep on understanding his systems and processes for how he did it, primarily with a momentum-based swing trading breakout strategy, then this is the video that's going to explain it to you. There are plenty of Kualamagi videos out there on YouTube and the like, but this is a summary of the systems and processes and thinking about his strategy from five key parts. How does he identify trades? How does he initially control the risk? How does he mitigate risk on the trades? How does he optimize the profits? And then also have a deep dive into his mindset and also think about things from a deliberate practice standpoint. How on earth did he get so good at trading and how can you try and repeat the success that he has had? MarketSmith are the sponsor of this video. You'll see a couple of charts throughout this presentation. Certainly as we're talking about the screening and fundamental side of things, there is a discounted trial available in the comment section below if you are interested. And with all of that out the way, let's start getting into the systems and processes for how Kuala Maggi turned five grand into 100 million dollars. So let's begin with Kuala Maggi's returns. This was a print screen from one of his Twitch streams. So you can see in 2011, he actually blew up trading accounts around about three or four times. But you can see from 2011 to 2020, including these big down years, that is an average annual return of 268%. If you take out the two down years and go from 2013, it is around about 350%. So absolutely phenomenal returns. How on earth did he do it? What are the systems and processes that he used? Well, you're watching the right video. Let's get into it. So Strategy overview, we're thinking about long setups. So Kuala Maggi has three main setups. Two of those are long, one of those are short. The two long setups are continuation-based breakouts. So that is basically breakouts from flags, VCPs, Darvis boxes, cup and handles of the like, then also episodic pivots. What on earth are they? They are basically gap up based breakouts. He also has the parabolic short, but we're not gonna go into shorting in this video. We're gonna keep it very much focused on the long side. So if I could summarize the strategy in about two sentences, it would be this. Trade leading momentum stocks from these sets setups with asymmetric risk reward potential, i.e. little risk, lots of upside. Once in the position, mitigate risk and keep part of the position to ride the short slash intermediate term trend, which Kuala Maggi defines as the 10 day and or 20 day moving average. He gives much more emphasis to the 10 day moving average, certainly for the quicker momentum stock. So this is just a little visual here to give you a flavor of the type of things we are going to be looking at. So you will see throughout this presentation that Kuala Maggi refers to setups that just repeat time and time and time again. And he puts a significant emphasis on deliberate practice. If you don't know what deliberate practice is, Anders Ericsson wrote a book called Peak, which is absolutely fantastic for how we actually learn and how you master a skill. Trading is a skill set. So by the end of this video, you'll have a much better understanding of the knowledge, but then also the steps you need to take to develop the skill set. It's great to have the knowledge, but you need to have the skill set. So what are the repeatable patterns that just happen? time and time and time again and Kuala Maggi refers to it many times about going back studying history and having thousands tens of thousands of stocks in your chart model database it's in essence it boils down to these these four there's a lot of variations but in essence it's these four it's flags triangles pennants vcps it's cup and handles it's flat bases also known as Darvis boxes and it's wedges which is slash a volatility contraction pattern low mid pivot they are basically the four chart four chart patterns you'll see these momentum leading stocks put in time and time and time again. So let's keep going down and down and down. So remember, we're starting off high and we're going further and further and further into the weeds. So identify how stocks move. So while you're looking at this visual, I'm just going to read a little bit to you. So these are quotes from Kuala Maggi. Stocks, cryptos, and all assets classes, they move like stairs. So this is the basic premise. How do stocks move? How do cryptocurrencies move? And I've got lots of examples to go through, including quizzes to try and make it a little bit more engaging for you as we go. This is how they move generally. They make a move, then they go sideways or pull back, make another move, go sideways or pull back, make another move. This is how stocks move. Study any stocks that are up hundreds or thousands of percent over many years. This is how they move. They move in stairs. Our job is to buy here. Our job is not to buy here, not to buy here, not to buy over here. Our job is to buy it here. So our job is to buy at the exact time it starts to build the next step higher so here basically when it's breaking out of those consolidations so there's continuation base patterns cup and handles vcps flags wedges pennants whatever you want to call it so our job is to buy it as it's breaking out now i'm not going to be 100 correct my win rate is 25 percent. that probably threw you off a little bit there didn't it the key is all about sm small losers big winners so small losers big winners we're going to get all into the asymmetric risk versus reward where you place your initial stop loss as we progress throughout then you get the moving averages the 10 day the 20 day and the 50 day 
the leading stocks keep surfing those moving averages. This is a continued theme you are going to see throughout. So the next two slides are a little bit text heavy, but they need to be there for you to start understanding the strategy. Then as we start progressing, we're going to get into lots and lots of slides, as you can see, and the quizzes. So it's the same theme, a big move, then a pullback or sideways consolidation, and then the stock starts finding support or surfing one of the moving averages. It could be the 10 day, the 20 day, the 50 day, and many times it's a combination of two of them. You're gonna see that when we start looking at setups, usually the 10 and 20 day. Then it gets tighter and it breaks out of that range. It's just the same theme over and over. This is how stocks move. This is how stocks have moved over the past 100 years. Go back and look at charts from the 1920s, 50s, 80s, 90s. They do the same thing over and over again. You just need to memorize these patterns. So remember those patterns that I was showing you. Stocks move like stairs, leg higher, sideways, leg higher, sideways. We are trying to identify the areas where the next step higher could be formed. Tight areas, we're looking for tight areas where we can get a tight stop and a good risk to reward. This is how stocks have moved for 100 years and there's no reason they shouldn't stop moving like this. You need to build a database. This is thinking about the deliberate practice element. You need to build a database with thousands of stocks. If you don't spend at least 500 to 1,000 hours studying this one single setup, it's super simple. It's not easy, but it's simple. But you still need to study hundreds, hundreds of hours, thousands of hours over the next few years. That's how you master it and make millions, tens of millions. With this one setup, you can make tens of millions. If you spend 1,000 hours studying these setups, you're gonna figure out the variations of the setups as well. Now, Paolo Mangi in a tweet on the 17th of February 2023, I sound like a little bit of a stalker here, don't I? But he said he now uses the 10-day exponential, exponential moving average instead of the instead of the simple. So a slight change, a slight change there. I use the 10 email as well. Uh, not that you potentially care. I rarely buy stocks below the 50-day moving average. So he wants the stronger momentum stocks, which invariably when they're building the pivots, when they're getting tighter and tighter and tighter, are actually above their 50-day. Quite commonly, you will see them around the 10 and 20 moving averages. For this method, you don't need to scale in. You buy everything at once, but you need to scale out. So sell one third or half of your position after three to five days, and then use the 10-day moving average as your trailing stop. Then when the stock closes below the 10-day, you sell the rest. Now I know there's a lot of information coming at you very early on in this video. As we progress throughout and you make it towards the end of this video, it's all gonna start clicking, it's all gonna start making sense. Obviously, you can't determine early in the day whether it being the stock is going to have higher volume, especially if you're trading liquid min large cap stocks. They always have volume, so you don't need to worry about it. So high volume around the pivot. You need clean setup, something that keeps surfing that isn't all over the place choppy around moving averages. So some stocks have really nice clean moves as you're gonna see others just chop around, chop around, chop around. Now you wanna avoid the choppy stocks because as you get into the trade management, you're just gonna get chopped around. You'll see some examples. Just because it's a good setup doesn't mean it's gonna work. As Kuala Mangi said, his win rate is around about 20, 25% or so. So let's start higher and then work down. So thinking about the market environment, now the key moving averages to be paying attention to on this chart here are gonna be the black line, which on my charts is the 10 EMA, the blue line, which is the 21 EMA, which you can kind of think of as a 20 day moving average on Kuala Maggi's charts. And then the purple line is the 50 SMA. So black, blue, and purple are gonna be the key moving averages for you to be paying attention to here. So just study this chart and I've color coded it to basically show when these moving averages in the market is turning up and then turning down. And then think about this as trading environments because not every strategy is gonna work fantastically well across every single market environment. Sometimes the market goes up, sometimes the market goes down, sometimes the market goes sideways, right? Any type of break and breakout or momentum strategy is gonna work best when the market is in momentum mode. What is momentum mode? We'll get onto it. Sometimes you have to be in cash for weeks and months on end when the market is not good. Think about those red areas. You don't need to trade all the time. It's, t it's fine to sit on cash for months on end. It's easier said than done. The NASDAQ composite is the relevant index. So this is IXIC, if you're wondering. You don't need to look at anything other than the NASDAQ. 90% of the stocks I trade are in the NASDAQ. Generally, you want to see, what, what you want to see is the 10-day sloping higher and the 20-day is sloping higher and the 10-day needs to be above the 20-day. So you see here, you have the black line above the blue line, also trending nicely above the purple line as well. 
it's fine if it undercuts it a little bit for a while but that's the general that's the general rule so if it's undercutting it a little bit that's okay but generally speaking you want to see it trending up here's kind of a good example for where the trend is up but it does kind of undercut it briefly a couple of times but moving averages sloping up 10 above the 20 20 above the 50 would be an ideal environment if you get breakouts when the 10 and 20 day moving averages are sloping down in the nasdaq comp and the 10 days below the 20 day there's a high failure rate you probably shouldn't swing trade on the long side so i've kind of indicated that with the red zones every year there's usually a three to six month period that's challenging you'll make little or no money and that's fine when you get these runs that last for three to six months where you can, but, but then you get these runs where that last for three to six months where you can double and triple your account. You just have to wait for those periods. You have to wait it out. So what he's saying there is wait for the market to be good for your strategy. Know where your strategy performs better, performs worse when it's in a period, maybe a little bit of a kind of a, uh, a trade, tradeaholic like me potentially, but just be trading smaller during those tougher periods. Understand it's going to be, it's going to be, um, it's going to be tougher period. So let's go into the next slide. Now, this is where we're going to start breaking it down a little bit more. We're going to look at breakouts. I'm going to give you quizzes. I've cut off the chart at the actual kind of like trigger point bar. So where Quagga Maggi would then be looking to enter the trade and taking trades that he discussed and spoke about five star, seven star kind of setups. And then we'll be doing quizzes for them. So we're really going to try and help you with your pattern recognition. Again, we're just starting here with a bit of an overview and then working our way down. So what are you looking for? And we're looking at continuation pattern breakouts. So that's going to be your flags, your pennants, your Davis boxes, your VCPs, your cup and handles, so on and so forth. So on here, obviously, the white line is price. The green line is going to be a trend line. And then for the purpose of this, the yellow is the 10 day, the blue is the 20 day, and then the purple is the 50 day. So number one, a big move high in the past one to three months, anywhere from 30% to 100% plush. And usually the rally lasts <clears throat> a few days to weeks orderly pullback and consolidation with higher lows. So higher lows are like this. So if you look at what price is doing here, see from here, so this is the high here, it pulls down, bounces, makes a lower high, but then it puts in a higher low. So this high here, or this low is higher than this low. So it's making higher lows, very important concept. Orderly pullback and consolidation with higher lows and tightening range in the consolidation phase. It's very similar if you've read Minovini's book, The Volatility Contraction Pattern. Volatility contracts from left to right, preferably volume drying up as well. A breakout of the consolidation. The consolidation phase is usually two weeks to two months, so somewhere between two weeks and eight-ish eight -ish weeks, maybe 10-ish weeks as well. During the consolidation phase, the stock surfs the rising 10 and or 20-day moving average and sometimes the 50. So this is an important point and we'll get onto it I'll explain it on the on the next slide. So as the stock is going up here, and you'll see this on the examples, ideally you want to see the share price staying above the 10 day and the 21 day. It may come down and kind of test and reverse quickly. That's good behavior. As the base is starting to build, you would like to see the stock respecting either the 10 day as it's doing here. See how it pulls down, bounces, pulls down, bounces off, bounces off, and then tightens around the 10 day. So you, ideally you'd like to see stocks that respect the moving averages that you are going to be using from a trade management standpoint. You don't wanna have the stocks that are just chopping around like this all over the place. They're gonna be an absolute nightmare. So number one, how to trade it. Enter on opening range highs, and you might be like, what on earth is in, uh, what on earth is opening range highs? Don't worry, got slides on it. We're gonna be explaining everything. This video is extremely thorough. Enter on opening range highs, so ORH for the first one, five, or 60 minute candlestick. The first 60 minute candlestick caveat is actually a 30 minute candlestick because of six and a half trading hours in the session. You can use whatever time frame or combination. You don't have to use intraday charts. Enter when the stock is starting to break out. So basically, you're trying to identify these pivot points and enter pretty much as soon as you can when the stock is starting to break out. The stop is always lows of the day, so lows of the breakout day, and should not be wider than the ATR, which is the average two range or ADR, which is the average daily range. So one is a number, one is a percentage. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. Do not worry. Of the stock to keep the risk versus reward favorable. And you might already be going like, what is going on? Don't worry, it's all going to make sense. Again, this is detailed stuff. It's in the weeds. You don't go from five grand to 100 million and it's all kind of broad brush, vague, fluffy duffy stuff, okay? Then sell one third or one half of the position after three to five days. So once you're in the trade, after three to five days, sell one third or one half of the position. This comes into the mitigation part. So remember, we're looking at identify, control, mitigate, and optimize. We're going to go deep on all of them. The rest of the position should be trailed with the 10 or 20 day moving average. Depends how fast the stock is. 
if a beginner stick to the 10 day wait for the first close so not intraday if price is going underneath wait for the first close below the 10 day oftentimes you can see kind of shake out demand tails undercutting the level so what i've got here and we've got oh, i don't know maybe at least 10 examples like this if not more and then we're actually going to look at bitcoin we're going to look at eth um, as well and i've tried to make this section here interactive for you i appreciate you're probably just sat there looking looking at your laptop bored you're probably surfing netflix and other things like that so in this section here i've really tried to involve you and try and help you train your pattern recognition skills so these are then quotes from kuala Maggi, and he's specifically talking about the setup that i am showing you so this is coming from the horse's mouth so prts this is a seven star setup on a five star scale big big move go sideways build a tight range look how tight it gets breaks out and boom, memorize this. So I'll just break down the first couple for you so you start getting it a little bit more, but I've tried to make some annotations. So if you look at the trend here, the stock goes from a couple of dollars up to a high here of about $9.50. Do you see how not once it closes below its 10 day moving average? And on my chart here, it's actually, on my chart is actually the 10, the 10 EMA. Do you see how it just trends perfectly along the whole the whole time? This is really, really, really good to see. It holds here, it holds here, a little shake out demand tail here, and then it starts going into this tightening range, holds above the 21 EMA here, then it goes tight, 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 and the volume dries up. So this here, memorize this. Seven star setup on a five star scale there's some where kuala Maggi refers to it as a six star setup or a five and a half star setup but this is the only one i could find where he says seven star setup on a five star scale this is this is my interpretation and from my own kind of experience as well this is pretty much as good as it gets for a high type flag but note the cleanness of the move so this is what you want to see now what i've done is then showed you the aftermath as um as well well, the aftermath that's the wrong word isn't it what happened afterwards basically so here you go there's the breakout coming through here tight 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 see how it just surfs the 10 day and then a little bounce off near the 21 ema the blue lines are 21 ema on my chart i like the 21 ema rather than the 20 day that's from my own evidence experience and things like that but see how tight it gets in it but for the purpose of this it's pretty much a 20 day moving average okay and then tight and then breaks out let's do another one so amd this is a stick six star setup on a five star scale you've got to memorize this you don't get many of these look how tight it is bounces perfectly off the 20 day here and then gets really tight here look how tight it gets but do you see here this is a real subtle point but a really important point look how smooth the trend is before the stock even starts basing. So the prior uptrend, you want to see the stock saying above all the key moving averages. So okay if it comes down a couple of times like this, see how it holds the 10 here, see how it holds the 10 here. There's actually a gap down reversal bar underneath the 21. Then it's tight, tight, tight. Look how the volume dries up. Six star setup on a five star scale. There it is. See how tight it gets? And then the trend thereafter. Really, really, really good setup. Exceptional setup. APPS. This is a five and a half star. So we've gone seven star, six star, five and a half star. Okay. This is a five and a half star setup on a five star step on a five star step. Memorize this startup. Stock makes a big move. See how it holds the 10. Holds the 10 and the 10 and the 21 in here. And in here as well. Go sideways, surfs the 20 day, which in essence is this blue line here. Okay. See how it holds here. It builds higher lows. Then a tight range in here. See how tight the stock gets, and then a high volume breakout. Let's so do the next one. There it is. There's the setup. And then see how well it trends there afterwards. So the, the trending point before the base, I'm just going to emphasize this. The best, in the, this is my own anecdotal experience. The best indication for how a stock is going to act in the future is how did it act in the past. So if you get a really nice trending stock pre-base, it's more likely that it's going to be a really nice trending stock post-base. You then get another five-star setup in here. Look how tight it gets. Really, really, really good. Another one here. This is Celsius. So it makes a big move. Here you go, makes a big move, surfs on the 10 and 20 day moving averages, starts building higher lows off the 20 day, takes out this tight range. This is a nice five star high tight flag. So see here, nice uptrend, big move, holds in here, then it's tight, 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 starts building higher lows in here, nice flag, nice bit of ECP action. Look how the volume dries up. Okay, here it is, here's the setup in here. See how it comes out of this base, starts trending high lows, tight bar in there, 
and then off it goes. Next one, Kodaks. This is a six star setup on a five star scale. Makes a big move, it gets tighter and tighter, builds higher lows, goes from surfing the 10 day to surfing the 20 day, has a range that gets tighter and tighter, has a really narrow range day before the breakout, and then it breaks out on higher volume. That's the perfect setup. Does it sound like I'm repeating myself in these slides? That is the whole point of it. Okay. It's a repeatable process. These stocks do the same things, the same patterns, the same behavior characteristics in terms of the price action, in terms of volume, in terms of the relative strength, where the stock is setting up into in relation to key moving averages. What it does it's specifically before the breakout, i.e. it gets tighter and tighter and tighter, build tire lows around the key moving averages, the volume dries up. Same thing. Keeps on happening. Study them. Learn them. Breaks out here, do they all go up 588% in five sessions? Absolutely not, but you're trying to position yourself in front of stocks that can go up 588% in five sessions. And you're trying to study deliberately what did a stock do before it went up 588% in five sessions? What did it do? Are there other stocks that did similar things? Can I profit from that? Can I be, um, can I basically profit from that? That's, uh, I can't say any better than that, to be honest with you. This one, very good setup, X E E X P I. So you see how the stock makes a big move here, pulls in to the 10, to the uh, 2021 in here, and then it bounces again. It has a nice shake out tomato underneath the 10, reclaims, tight, 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 volume dries up. It's a really good setup. There it is there. You could also look at it as maybe a cup and handle with a high handle or a flag type pattern there, but see the trend unfold afterwards. And then you wanna try and ride the intermediate term trend. Fastly, five star setup right here so see how the stock is trending see how it holds the 10 in here then it holds the 10 in here see how it gets really tight there's this inside bar here look how the volume dries up same things are happening note the relative strength line as well look at the reaction to the earnings big volume on the earnings positive reaction then the trend there afterwards you'll see there's a quote a little bit later that an ep so an episodic pivot which is basically a gap up base breakout that can often be the start of the trend so what you can have is stock that's been basing for kind of six months, a year, a couple of years, then suddenly this earnings report comes out and it catches a lot of the large operators off guard. So suddenly they then start piling into it. So then you get this really nice post earnings uptrend, which you'd like to see do what? Trend above the key moving averages and bounce off of them, the 10 and the 20, right? And then go and build a high type flag, a VCP, cup and handle, whatever it may be. So here's Fastly, there's the setup. There's a trend there afterwards. That was another very good setup there, um, in my view. Perfect setup here. This is a six star setup on a five star scale. This is a ridiculously good setup, okay? This one here. So see how the stock makes a big move? Oh, look, notice notice the reaction to the earnings and the volume coming through in the 52 week high and the relative strength. If you wanna use that, it's a free tool. Search my name on TradingView and the indicators. You will, you will find it and then you can just pin it to the bottom of your chart like this, or you could have it on your chart, whatever you wanna do. So the stock power's up here, holds the 10, then it pulls back down to the to the uh, 2021 in here, and then see how you actually get those of you who've read Darvis' book, Darvis's box, um, Darvis's book is gonna, is, is Darvis' box, but Darvis's book will be familiar with the Darvis box, which is basically a rectangle. It's quite common to actually see a little Darvis box play out in three sessions, five sessions before. So see how it just tightens up here along the 20, for me, the blue line's the 21 EMA. I just use 21 EMA, but the, the 20 day is pretty much where the 21 EMA is. There's not much between them for these for these ones here. So see how it just tightens up in here? Look at this ridiculously tight bar. So I'll just go into a little bit of waxing lyrical about supply and demand. Why is this really tight bar on low relative volume important? What does it actually tell you from supply and demand? It tells you there isn't much supply that's coming to the market. That's really good for you to know if you're targeting a breakout. Second fold, it also indicates that you could go in with a very tight stop loss as well. Interesting, we'll come to that later. So here it is, here's the breakout, here's the trend. And Kuala Maggie saying on this stock here, this is why I advocate trailing some of your shares on the 10 day because sometimes you can catch something like this. So he's talking about this move here where it goes up 226%. Something like this. These things are really gonna to add to the bottom line of your accounts. You catch a few of these now and then, oh man, these are the ones that are gonna grow your accounts exponentially. Next one, overstock. This is a five star setup. So see the run the stock has here, pulls down, bounces off the 21, holds around the 1021 in here, holds in here, and then look, it's these tight candlesticks coming up again. Tight, tight, tight. Look how the volume dries up, tight, tight, tight. See how the stock's building higher lows within the base. They look like the same thing keeps happening because it is, right? Tight, tight, tight. There's the breakout, goes up 319% before it closes below. 
the 10 and 21 day EMAs. I'm telling you, if you catch some of me, these, these moves, and he's specifically talking about overstock, this is up 300% from this trigger breakout. You catch these kinds of trades now and then, these are the ones that are going to grow your account. So Kuala Magi, as you'll see as we get into the kind of optimizing profits phase of this presentation, really focuses on getting the big ones right, getting the home run trades right. There is no point if a stock is going to go up 300% for it closes below the, the 10 day, say, and you sold it out at 20% and you think, oh, that's really good. I had 2% risk and I sold it at 20%. That's 10 times my initial risk. Yeah, but if it goes up 300%, you completely miss the point, basically. Next slide. Kodak's. Oh, I jumped forward too far. So Kodak's, this one here. Look at this thing. It's all, It always finds support on the 50-day. So the purple line in here, in here, in here, in here. Keep surfing the 50-day. These are the only technical indicators you need. The 10-day, the 20-day, and the 50-day moving averages. You don't need to look at intraday charts. This is all you need to make millions, literally. So see how it's building higher lows. It's finding support of action around the 50-day. And then there's the result there. Powerful breakout. Up, up, up it goes. But then what do you notice here? See how it U-turns here. So I didn't just want to show you ones that go up 500% uh, or whatever. I want to show you ones that actually the stock makes a big move. But then look how it U-turns. This is why, as I've noted here, the sell rules really, really, really matter. There's the first close below the 10 day in there. Etsy. This is a five-star setup. Take a screenshot of this. Memorize this pattern. So the stock makes a big move and then it pulls down, finds support around the 21. See how it pulls down, higher lows, tight, tight, tight. There's that little Darvis box building again. Look how it's a tight bar, nearly an inside bar, sitting on the 10 and 21. Look how the volume dries up. Look at the 52-week highs. Out it goes, right? And you could look at that as a, those of you who studied Minervini's work, bit of a VCP, right? One contraction, two contraction, three contraction, tight, 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 tight. Really good. Next one, Fiverr. I can immediately see a five-star setup. And in a couple of slides time, I'm going to be giving you a quiz where I put a blank chart and asking you, can you see the setups? So again, trying to really help you dial in, train your pattern recognition here. Fiverr, I can immediately see a five-star setup. Look how the stock makes a really good move and look how it stays above. It's 10 EMA the whole time. A little kind of shake out in here and then it recovers. Then it pulls back down, holds on its 21 for my chart here and then puts in this high low, tight, 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 mini kind of little Darvis box in there and then see how the volume dries up. Interesting. And then there you go. There's the breakout. There's the trend. So I will come on to a little bit later on talking about the 10 day and the 21 um, and showing you some stats that I that I ran my um, myself. So here we go. Can you identify the three five star setups? And these are five star setups as Kuala Maggie defines them, as you are going to see on the next slide. So here you go. Can you find the three five-star setups on this chart? As I said, I want it to be engaging. I want to try and um, want to try and involve you in this. So there's three. Can you find the three? I'll show you. Three, two, one. There they are. Number one. Here is it. This is Kuala Maggie's quote. Here is a five-star setup. Number two. This was an even better setup. Look how tight it got. So see how it's building high lows, one contraction, two contraction, three contraction, four contraction, high lows, high lows, high lows, just tightening up on the 10 day. Look how the volume dries up. Look how tight it got. The tightness is really, really key. Number three here, another five star setup. Boom. Look at this. See how tight it got before it gaps up and breaks out there. Look at the relative strength line as well. Let's do another one. Can you identify the two five star setups and two other good setups? So we're looking for two five-star setups, and then we're looking for two good setups. Two five-star, two good setups. Three, two, one. There we go. This was a really good setup. These are Kuala Maggie's quotes as he was looking at the chart. This was a really good setup. Not a five-star because the previous day's candle was kind of loose. So you see how it wasn't... That, so he's talking about the breakout here. The prior bar, it was kind of loose. It's a pretty good bar, but it's kind of loose. It's not as tight as some of the other ones. And it had been building higher lows. This one in here, this is a five-star setup. See how tight it got? Higher lows. See how it's tightening? A little Darvis box action again. Another one here. This is a five-star setup, but it would have stopped you out because three bars later, so this bar later, see how it breaks out here? And then here, it took out the lows of the day. So Kuala Maggi will buy the breakout, opening range highs, and then stop loss low of the day. So this bar here stopped him out. And then the blue arrows, I've just highlighted another two. I think they're very good setups. I think this is a five-star setup for me. And I think this also is a five-star setup. This is a really good chart to study. Let's do another one. Can you see the five-star setup and the 3.5-star setup? So there's a five-star setup on this chart somewhere. And there is a 3.5-star setup as per Kuala Maggi's criteria. Three, two, one. There you go. Has a big, big move. Look how it keeps surfing the 20-day. 
this bit in here, this five star one. Then it keeps getting tighter and tighter. Look how tight it gets as it surfs the 20 day. Then it has a high volume breakout. This thing needs to be in your watch list when it starts getting tight. So see how it starts getting tight here around the 10 and the 21. As soon as it starts breaking out, that's when you buy it. And don't worry, we're gonna go on to how you actually buy them a little bit later on. Then he's talking about this one in here, if you were able to find it, well done. This is maybe 3.5 star, another good setup. Keep surfing the 20 day, build high lows and puts in a tight range. Maybe because you kind of have this bearish day in here, it's not as clean a setup. Um, whereas here it's just high lows, high lows, high lows. And what chart pattern do you see? Oh, it's a nice big cup and handle, isn't it? Interesting. Look at all the 52 week highs as well. We'll talk about relative strength a little bit later on. Another one. Can you identify the setup on the 10 day? So I use the EMA, so 10 day EMA. My understanding is Kuala Maggie Newton now uses the 10 EMA instead of the 10 day simple moving average. So can you find the setup on the 10 day EMA plus a bonus setup? Three, two, one, there you go. So builds a base and starts breaking out, makes a move, surfs the 10 day, and then you get the two really tight candles in here, tight, tight, with higher lows and then breaks out. There's your breakout. That's a good setup. And I also think this one here, for me, that's a five star setup. See, good reaction to the earnings, a little bit of a common theme here, isn't it? Good reaction to the earnings, then it goes and builds a post earnings, earnings um, base, builds the higher lows. Look at this kind of Darvis box action. See how it's just basically going sideways, building higher lows in the base as well, but then it gets really, really tight. You get this extremely tight inside bar, look how the volume dries up, and then see how the stock just trends. It's also why I like the 21 EMA. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. Let's do another one. Can you identify the four good setups? So on this chart here, there's four really good setups. Four really good setups. Three, two, one, there they are. One in here. See how it just gets really tight, 1021, stock is in an uptrend. Look at the 52 week highs on the RS line. Look how the volume dries up. This is what I'm pointing to the day before the breakout. Look how the volume is drying up below this black line here. This is the 30 day average for the volume. That's what I use on the volume, 30 day average. See how the volume is drying up on, I just call them trigger bars because for me, they're the last piece of the proverbial jigsaw puzzle, right? So see how you get this really tight bar, these got trigger bars coming through, really tight here, really tight in here. Just ridiculously good setups, worth studying. But then look how it then trends. Note what moving averages it then trends. So yes, you want to study the setups, how stocks set up, but then how do they move afterwards? This is all the deliberate practice nature of it. This one here. So now we're actually going into how do you trade opening range highs? So how do you actually trade them? So I've got some at the time of filming this, which is um, which is in May. I've picked out picked out some recent stocks um, to talk about opening opening range highs. So how does Kuala Maggi actually enter them? So we're going to be looking at O N O N here. Okay, stop makes a big move. Okay, pulls back in, finds support of action around its 10, stays above its 21, gets really tight in here, inside bar, look how the volume dries up, really good reaction to the earnings, huge sales, I'm gonna show you a market smith chart um, of this stock later on, huge earnings, huge sales, huge estimates, powerful, powerful stock, pretty new in terms of its IPO. So on the next bars, or the next slides I should say, we're gonna be looking at the one minute chart, five minute chart and the hourly chart. So the 60 minute chart as well. So I'm gonna explain how do you trade, how do you trade opening range highs, but remember it's in the context of we're looking here and then we're looking at this bar here. Okay, and then I also want you to be aware of the average daily range percentage, which is 4.79%, which I will explain on the next slide because it all feeds into the risk management. So let's start talking about it. Remember that price level of 30, 09. That was the high of this bar here. So remember, I called them trigger bars. For me, I'm very, very visual how I learn. I have ADHD, I have dyslexia. So for me, I have to get things out of my head and just make them very visual. I can't really keep things in my head. I gotta get it, gotta get it out in front of me. So concepts for me to kind of then understand things and then try and help me internalize things are really helpful. So trigger bars, that's how I think about them. Those really tight bars where the volume dries up. So I'm just gonna to refer to them as trigger bars. Kuala Maggie does not call them trigger bars, but for me, for the purpose of this video, to try and teach you the best way I possibly can, I'm gonna call them trigger bars. So the high of this trigger bar, inside bar, tight, in the base, sitting there on the 10, 30, 0, 9. As we go to the next slide, so this blue level here, okay, 30, 0, 9, was the pivot breakout. So the high, of the final candlestick. So we are on the one minute chart. So this is the first one minute candlestick. And do you see how it breaks out above yesterday's high 
of 3009 okay see how it breaks out so opening range highs you're looking for the breakout through the pivot wherever you determine the pivot to be so for this example here we're just going to think about the pivot the pivot being the buy point of the prior day's high, which was that really tight candlestick that I refer to as a trigger bar. So you get the first one minute candlestick. It breaks out. Fantastic. Look at the volume coming through. I call this bullish synchronicity, where you basically get wide, what you get high relative volume and you get a widespread candlestick. Okay, volume is basically confirming the positive price action, bullish synchronicity. Makes sense, right? And then you get this hammer type candlestick. Then you get this inside hammer type candlestick and then you get the breakout. So the opening range highs depends on what time frame you are using. So we're going to look at it on the one minute chart, the five minute chart and the 60 minute chart. And I've got plenty of examples and we're going to look at these opening range highs through continuation based breakouts. So IE stocks that are coming out of pivots from VCPs, flags, pennants, Davis boxes, cup and handles. We're also then going to look at them for episodic pivots. So where the stock basically gaps up on the earnings and is taking out the highs of the base and preferably above all the key moving averages. This is probably going to be quite hard to understand i'll do my best at it but some reps and sets on the next slides will hopefully start to drill the point home so in essence you are looking for the stock to break out show that there is there are a lot of buyers there there is demand there. we can visually see that in terms of the price action and the volume right and then you are looking for the highs if you are using the one minute chart the highs of the first one minute candlestick assuming it's taken out the pivot as this stock here has done you are then entering as price breaks out through the highs of the first one minute candlestick so the high of this first one minute candlestick is thirty dollars fifty six so the entry is then through here at thirty dollars fifty six this is the entry now that's the opening range highs, but now we've got to start thinking about the controlling risk. So I'm jumping ahead a little bit and bringing in the controlling risk here as well. Okay, so I was to kind of explain it. I can't just teach you the identified part without the control part. We're bringing in the control part while we're talking about the identified part. But there is a specific section with quotes on controlling risk and thinking about risk. But we're jumping ahead a little bit here, but we'll catch ourselves up a little bit later. So then you have to be thinking, okay. Here is the opening range highs on the one minute chart. It's through here. So the entry, there's probably going to be some slippage, no doubt, 30.56. So then your stop loss is going to be the low of the breakout day, which is where? It's the low of this bar here, which is $29.98. What is that percentage? Assuming perfect execution, perfect fillage, which is unlikely, okay? But here, 1.89%. Now, I use the average daily range rather than the ATR. But Kuala Maggi, he uses the ATR, but he also says you can use the average daily range. In essence, try and understand the point that I'm trying to get across here. So the average daily range, mine is set to 20 days. This is the average daily percentage move the stock has made over the last 20 days. You can use ATR as well, which will give you a numerical uh, a numerical figure so it will give you dollars or cents or dollars and cents depending on how depending on uh, how much how much the stock moves so what this is saying is the average daily percentage move of the stock over the last 20 days on the daily chart is 4.75 percent now to keep the risk versus reward in check and not getting out of whack which is quite among his own words you'll see that in the controlling risk section as we progress a little bit later on Ideally, you want the initial stop loss to be less than the ATR or the ADR percentage. Make sense? So for me, I, I use the ADR. So I'm going to teach you with the ADR, but it's pretty much the same thing. But if this here, so let's just say I'll give you the ATR example, right? Let's say your stop is going to be from, it's just over $1.50, right? Imagine that your stop was going to be $30 and your entry was $30.56. So that would be a dollar, a dollar fifty, okay? A dollar and a half would be your stop. So then you could look at the ATR and you might see that the ATR, the average true range of the stock over the last 20 days is $2. So therefore your $1.50 stop loss is less than the ATR, which we're saying is $2. You can do it that way or if you prefer percentages, I personally prefer percentages. It just works better for me. But if you prefer using actual numerical levels in terms of dollars and thinking in dollars and cents, use that. If you work better with the ADR percentage, 
use that. It's pretty much of a muchness. You're just trying to get stops that in relative proportion to how much the stock moves, how quick the stock is, looking at the ATR or the ADR percentage, okay, you want it to be less than that. So here we have, that's the last I'm going to kind of touch on ATR. I'm just going to refer to it as ADR percentage. If I keep jumping between them, I'm going to confuse myself. I'm going to confuse you as well. So the average daily range percentage for on, ON, ON is the ticker, over the last 20 days is about 4.75%. It's a little bit different because it wasn't specifically here because I then took this screenshot about two weeks later. But either way, let's imagine it's 4.75%. So if your initial stop is 1.89%, is it less than the average daily percentage move for the stock over the last 20 days? Yes. So we're staying in check. That is good to see. So the entry is here. The stop is here. You're in track. You're, you're in. You're in kind of check. Now, Kuala Maggi will actually like to get his initial stop loss either a third or a half the ADR percentage or the ATR. Okay, pretty much pretty much the same thing when you actually kind of work it out and think it through. Okay, so ideally you want to be a third to half. That that there can actually indicate you've got a really good risk versus reward trade on your um on your hand. And remember what he said earlier. It's all about small losses, big small losses, big winners. So this is a way that you can see and kind of visually gauge are you are you in check? You have a nice metric here. So let's do another one on the five minute chart. So this is the same same stock, same breakout. So here you can see 3009. So it's taken out the highs of that kind of trigger bar. But this is the five minute chart. So it's now opening range highs on the five minute. Okay, so we're not on the one minute chart, we're now on the five minute chart. Does this look like a good first five minute candlestick for a breakout? Yes, why? that bullish synchronicity point, you have a widespread candlestick, your volume confirming the move. Okay, good. You don't necessarily need volume, but it's good. It's preferable to see, see the volume there. However, the five minute candlestick now closes at 30.87. So remember on the last chart, the high of the bar or the high of the five minute candlestick is higher than the high of the one minute bar, which was 30.56. So on the one minute chart, the opening range highs entry point, entry point was 30.56, whereas on the five minute chart, it's higher. So it's 30.87. So you can start to see here, you're paying a little bit more of a premium, aren't you? Maybe you're getting a little bit more kind of confirmation that buyers are stepping up and they are really stepping in, supporting this stock and it's powering out. And it's a good breakout potentially that you are, um, you're, you're catching on to here, but you're paying a premium in terms of you're having to pay more for the shares, which also means if you're going to stop loss lower the day, so lower the breakout day, therefore your stop loss is wider. So you you're paying a premium for this, okay? So you have to think about the one minute, the five minute, maybe using a combination um, of them. Maybe you get stopped out on the one minute and you buy it back on the five minute. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. But here, because we're buying it at a higher price and our stop loss is going to be at the same level, low of the breakout day, 29.98, our stop loss now is not 1.89%, it's 2.88%. And if we think about that relative to the ADR, which is 4.79%, it's still in check. Make sense? Still good. It's still less than the ADR percentage. It's around about half the ADR percentage. Okay, that's good. good. It's a little bit over half, but hopefully you understand in the point there. Let's do another one. Let's get forward too hard. Now, this one here, this is using it on the 60 minute chart and the first half an hour, sorry, well, it is a half an hour candlestick, but the first... On when, when you're on the 60 minute chart, there are six and a half trading, there are there are six and a half hours in the session. So therefore you have the first one hour candlestick is actually going to be a 30 minute bar, just the way that it's kind of played out. But what you see here is you see a breakout coming through and the high of this bar is 32.18. So if you're using the opening range highs, you're looking for a break through the high of that bar. And what do you notice? There is no break through the high of the bar. So there's no entry. Make sense? And also when you then think about it, well, 32.18, and if our stop loss is going lows of the day, that means 6.86%. Is this a good risk reward trade? Look at the ADR percentage. Probably not, right? Interesting. We'll do more and more and more. Hopefully, we'll start sinking through. So now we're going to look at Oracle, and I'm going to be quicker on this one. So Oracle, very slow stock. We're going to be talking about that as well. So Oracle, see how it trends up here, pulls back down, finds support on the key moving averages, tight, 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 really tight bar, volume dries up, 52 week high on the relative strength line while the stock's still within the base. That is a massive, massive sign of strength. So now we're going to be looking here and the high of that trigger bar is 95.12. Ready? So here's the blue line, 95.12 was the, was the pivot, was the entry price, okay? One minute chart. So Oracle actually takes it out 
pulls back down, closes here. So then you're looking for the opening range high. So you're looking for the breakout through the high of the first one minute candlestick because it is triggered through this level. There it is there at 95.33. Now stop loss low of the day is going to be where? It's going to be underneath the low of this one minute bar, which is 94.83. How much is that in terms of percentages? It's 0.52%. So just over half a percent. What's the ADR of the stock? 1.33 is an extremely slow stock. And we're going to be talking about slow stocks later on. You want to be more so focused on the quicker moving stocks, stocks with ADRs of 3%, 4%, 5%, 6% and above, ideally. But this here, is it a good resources world trade? Yeah, it is. Why? Because, well, the initial stop is half the ADR percentage and it's very low anyway. Five minute chart. So remember, here's the breakout on the five minute chart. So then you're looking for a break through the high of the first five minute candlestick, which is 95.73. So the entry would actually be coming through in here. Now your stop loss on the lows of the day is going to be wider because price is up. So you're playing a little bit of a premium here. So 0.94% is going to be your stop loss. That is about, what's that, two thirds of the, of the ADR. Okay, still, still kind of in check there. It's okay. Let's then do another one. So now we're looking at Oracle and this is on the 60 minute chart. Here's the first 60 minute candlestick. You can see the tightness of the proverbial trigger bar yesterday, right? The prior day. See how tight it is in here? There's the breakout volume coming through. But now you're looking for a break through the high of this bar, which is what? 96.64 stop loss lows of the day. 94.83 is what in percentages? 1.87%. What's the ADR of the stock? 1.33. So now the initial stop is greater than the ADR. Is that a good risk versus all trade? Probably not, right? Interesting. So let's do a couple of others. So we're actually going to do Bitcoin. We're going to do Bitcoin and ETH for a little bit because it's quite fascinating and you're going to see some of the probably best setups you are probably ever going to see actually in terms of in terms of flags. So this is, and these are Kuala Maggie's own words, okay? This is back in 2012. Back here, it was very, very illiquid, that should say, and unknown. Pretty much no one knew about Bitcoin back here. Okay, so look at these setups coming through here. This is in 2012. So even when hardly anybody knew about it and it wasn't very liquid, it's still forming the same setups. It is absolutely timeless. And what's interesting is you could go back and look at charts of stocks from 100 years ago. You will see the exact same chart pattern setting up on the exact same key moving averages. It's fascinating. And this is Bitcoin. Fascinating, absolutely fascinating. So look at this setup, make some move, go sideways, find support on the rising 10 and 20 day moving averages, gets tight, has a breakout. Does this look slightly similar or very, very, very similar to some of the stock setups we were looking at earlier? It does, doesn't it? Look how tight it's getting. And then over here, look how tight that's. Then you get another one, another stair step. Look at this, higher lows, go sideways, gets tighter and tighter, surfs the 10 day and another breakout. So see this black line here, see how it's surfing it. OK, you get these little shake out demand tails. That means intraday price is going below and then pushing up and closing above, going below, pushing up, closing above. Look how the volume dries up. Look at the high lows. It's the same things over and over again. Here again, start surfing the 10, 21 and 50 day in an uptrend gets tight and breakout. I'll show you the breakout on the next slide again, trying to help you train your pattern recognition. Look at this. See how it's just surfing the moving averages. You get these shakeout demand tails. They're good to see why, because it's indicating there is absorption of supply. There is accumulation going on. Price is going down, buyers are stepping up. Price is going down, buyers are stepping up. Good to see. See how it just holds the 50 in here. And then look at that. That is, again, for me, I'm very, very visual. So if the trigger bar concept helps you, fantastic. If it doesn't, ignore it. But for me, trigger bar, inside bar, sitting there, look how the volume dries up. It's the proverbial final piece of the jigsaw puzzle for me. Next slide. There's the breakout, and it goes up 1,600%. We're then going to look at this high tide flag here. So the strongest stocks and or cryptos find support on the 10-day, the strong ones the 20-day, and the slower ones on the 50-day generally. Same principle applied here for Bitcoin, how this was basing. There's also the law of kind of cause and effect. So the bigger the cause, bigger the base, the bigger the bigger the effect to the upside as um, as well. But there's the breakout. And before it closes, well, how do you have just stayed in this for the 10 day? Look at this. See how you get these undercuts here. And this is why you'll see there's actually one that there's three significant ones, right? I call these shakeout demand tails. Why? Because again, very visual, they're designed to shake you out. Shake out, demand tail. So price goes down, goes below the 10 day, then recovers. See here, it comes down to the 21 recovers, down to 21 recovers, down to 21 recovers. So this is why Kuala Magi, when he talks about the 10 day, wait for a close below the 10 day. 
because you will see this time and time again. These shakeout demand tails intraday, they come down, try and shake out weak hands, and then they reverse higher by, by the close. Don't happen like that every time. Obviously, you can get kind of change characters and then they turn around, but wait for the close because had you have waited here, you'd still be in this stock up 1600%. I'm not saying, saying you're going to top tick it, but see how well it kept you in for the move. That's the point, staying for the move. Then we're going to look at this high tight flag. This one here, so we're now looking at that high tight flag in the context of that move. And this is a quote about this setup. This is a very good setup. It went sideways for a while. It's a high tight flag. It being the price surfs the 10 and 20 day moving averages gets really, really tight. This is a five star setup. It's like a perfect one. From this setup, it goes up being priced four, five hundred percent in a month. Shake out the Montel, shake out the Montel. See how price is surfing the moving averages. And then look. Tight, 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 tight. Look how there's no volume. Remember, what does the tightness and the low relative volume tell you? What is it telling you? There's hardly any supply around. That's really good. That's the Minavini VCP point. You want the tightness. You want the low volume because it tells you there ain't much supply around. The stock is getting ready for the next leg higher, the next step higher, okay? Think about the stairs. Up, sideways, up, sideways, up, sideways, right? This one here, Bitcoin March 2013, high tight flag example. I'm just going to whiz through this one. It's got loads of examples here. Oh, this is one I was just showing you here. There's the before, there's the after. Absolutely textbook as I punched the mic. Next one here, Bitcoin, November 2013, high tight flag. All you have to think about are the 10, 20 and 50 day moving averages. Again here, perfect breakout. Look at this here. It being priced, surfs the 10 day moving average, goes sideways, boom, breakout. Look how powerful this is. Triple quadruples in a few months. These setups can be traded on any asset class. Look how perfect this is. Hopefully you're you can take print screens of this. Uh, I'm probably pulling some awkward faces at times of them. Um, but look at look at this. This is what you want to dial in and train your pattern recognition to. Ethereum, nothing different. Here is a good setup. It just keeps surfing the 20 day. So see this blue line here and it's 21 email on my chart. Pretty much of a muchness. Shake out the Montel, shake out the Montel, shake out the Montel, shake out the Montel. And then see how you get this kind of quote unquote trigger bar. Look at the volume dry. Look how it's just sitting there. That's your breakout coming through here. This is a five star setup. Now let's go into a little bit of a quiz. So Ethereum, let's see if you are learning something in this video. I hope you are, as it took a lot of time to, to put this together. So if you are enjoying it, please do subscribe to the channel if you're new. Please do press the like button for me. It really helps me grow the channel. So can you identify the three high quality setups? Can you see them? They're all five star. I'll give you three seconds. Three, two, one. There they are. Your job is to identify these. These setups have been appearing for the past couple hundred years, and they're probably going to appear for the next couple hundred years. This is how stocks and cryptos move. They move in stairs. You can clearly see one step, another step. So you see here how it's just going one step and then it goes sideways, another step, sideways, another step, sideways. That's how they move. Your job is to identify the next step when it's about to break out. Okay, what does it tend to do? We've been talking about it before it breaks out. Tightness in price, tightness in price, tightness in price. Where is the share price? Where is the candlestick in relation to the key moving averages before it do before it does it? What are you seeing time and time and time again? There's a very repeatable kind of nature to this. So hopefully you're studying it. Hopefully you're getting. You're not going to have a 100% win rate. You're going to be wrong most of the time. But once you catch a move like this, you're going to make 50 losers in one trade, and that's how you make money. So Kuala Magi really focuses on keeping losses really, really small relative to where he is targeting and achieving his average gain. He's trying to get these home run trades, these huge trades. Imagine buying ETH here. It goes from, what's that, 40, 48, something like that, 40, 46, 47 in here. And then look, it goes all the way up to 320-ish. 310 before it starts closing below its 21 EMA. So I actually like the 10 EMA and 21 EMA even here from this breakout. So it goes all the way up here before it closes below the 10 day. So the stock then goes or ETH goes, well, even from here, it goes from that all the way up there to over 300 from, for, from $40, $50 before it closes below the 10. That's the point. Get the big ones right. So that was continuation type pattern breakouts, okay? That is your VCPs, your flags, your pennants, your cup and handles, your Davis boxes, so on and so forth, so forth. We're now gonna go into EPs. What on earth is an EP? An episodic pivot, which I also, I didn't really understand the name. I don't, to me, the dictionary definition of episodic does not really define this, uh, nor do I really think about it as a pivot. So if you don't like the name, like I don't like the name, I think of it as a gap up base breakout. Invariably it happens on earnings as well. So EP, gap up base breakout, same kind of things, right? Whatever works for you to describe it, do that pretty much. So what are you 
looking for. In essence, you are looking for a stock that is building a base and then it breaks out of the base and invariably it's going to be on earnings, clearing all the key moving averages and preferably all the overhead resistance. Okay, As we do more examples, it's going to be a little bit more clear. I've got some examples as well. So EPs are, not always, but many times, are where a new trend starts. Good earnings, big beat and big volume, that's the secret sauce. So if you rewatch this video later on, and then remember at the start of the video, I was showing you the before and after of those stocks. Note how many of them, the beginning of the uptrend pre-base was on earnings. Interesting. So they're basically then post earnings bases for then the continuations. So what you could have here is a breakout and then a high type flag form over the next couple of months or so, something like that, a couple of weeks, who knows. So. Sometimes if you have a good looking setup and it gaps on the earnings or news, even if it gaps 5, 10, 15%, it could work out really nicely. So let's go through some examples. So EP guidelines, you want a gap up of greater than 10%. You want big volume near the open. Best, yeah, the best of the best often trade their average volume in the first 15 to 30 minutes. So that average daily volume, you'll actually see that level of volume come in in the first 15 to 30 minutes. You can use like, I, I use uh, I use TC2000 as well. They have a vol buzz on there so you can kind of see how much volume is, is coming in. You can just kind of eyeball it, use a little bit of maths if you want. If earnings gap, preferably high double digit and or triple digit earnings revenue figures plus significant beat of expectations. Best if the stock is coming out of a base and not overextended. So i.e. the stock's not been rallying for two, three, four months and it's kind of at the top of a rally. Rather, it's actually built in this instance here, a big cup and handle type base, and then it's gapping out. And the size of this base could be a couple of months, could be a year, something like that. And then suddenly it's coming out and it's beating the uh, the analyst expectations maybe they were expecting kind of a dollar to come in in terms of the EPS but actually the company reports two dollars or three dollars or four dollars that's a huge surprise um, oftentimes you could get it as well if a company comes out in the earnings and there's a there's a material change of some form in terms of the news i.e they announce we have just signed a ten year a ten year agreement with the government for our products and services and it's going to be worth x to us and x could be a significant increase on what the analysts were expecting so there can oftentimes be on these kind of eps a material change in kind of news and outlook for the company but potentially the earnings side as well a big a big beat coming in basically on the earnings and the revenue side of things so these are the type of eps you're looking for many times the stocks that are already in existing uptrends over the past six months a year or two years preferably they have been building high lows for many months and then they break out of a big trading range so you'd like to see the stock in a longer term uptrend so here above say the 200 above the 100 but then it's building this big size base and it breaks out of the base takes out the overhead resistance and is above all the key moving averages next slide so how do you trade an ep identify the setup before the market opens enter opening range highs so orh for the first one five or 60 minute candlestick with the stop low of the day so remember like we were doing the opening range highs looking at the one minute the five minute and the 60 minute we're going to do that again with eps trail your stop with the 10 or 20 day once they surpass the initial stop Usually you want to get in as early as possible when you have a five star setup. So like this EP here, you want EPs to gap up, gap above the moving averages. A strong EP should gap above resistance levels. So thinking about that from a structural te technical perspective, so i.e. resistance levels of a base, and then also thinking above the key moving averages, i.e. you don't want to see an EP that's gapping up into the 200 SMA, which is then sloping down like this. You don't want to see that or is gapping up into the 50 SMA and the 200 SMA. Volume was on the table before the opening range high. So as I said on the previous slide, okay, oftentimes in the first 15, 30 minutes, an EP can actually be trading its daily average volume. So I, if a stock trades a couple million shares a day, it could be trading those couple million shares within the first 15 minutes, half an hour. So let's go through some examples, probably the best way that you're going to learn this. So here we have Enphase Energy. We have two EPs on the chart. We have one here. We have one here, which is the better one. Which one do you think is the better one, given everything that I was just teaching you? Well, the first one here, what does it do? The stock's building a decent sized base, starts building higher lows in the base, albeit a bit choppy, does start to tighten up here. The relative strength is good. And then it EPs on good volume, 52 week highs coming through, clears the base highs. So that's the overhead resistance and it's above all the key moving averages. Interesting. That's a very good EP. Then over here, Kuala Maggi actually bought this EP and he bought this EP as well. This one here, why is this one not as good as this one? Because it's not clearing all the overhead resistance. Think about all the trap buyers up here. 
Okay, think about all the trap buyers. There's decent volume there as well. There's a lot of trap buyers here. So again, imagine the psychology point. A lot of trading is you want to have awareness of both you and your own actions, but also other market participants. So if you're thinking about this here, there could be a lot of people that are trapped up here and they've ridden this stock down. This decline was about 25, 30%, something, something like that. So they've ridden this stock down here and they have a loss in their portfolio of 20%, 25%, say. Then the stock gaps on earnings and suddenly their loss of... 20%, 25%, suddenly they're now break even. And what do they do? I'm going to sell. Why? Because they want to remove the pain that they are currently experiencing of having the loss. So they now have an opportunity to remove the pain. So they do. So a lot of supply then comes in here. So then it kind of makes sense. The stock then has to kind of back and fill, back and fill, back and fill like this. And then there's a breakout attempt here and then kind of rolls over pretty darn sharply. But if you think here, okay, there's going to be some trapped people within the base here, but suddenly the stock gaps on EP. Now they're going from fear to greed. Because now they go, well, hang on a minute. I had a loss in my portfolio. I was down 10% on this stock. I was down 15% on this stock, but now it's just gapped on earnings. I'm up 5%, 10%. Well, I'm holding on to this one. Interesting, right? Very different in terms of the psychology. So the best DPs you'll often find will gap above the base highs that they've been building and above all key moving averages. They won't gap in, gap up into declining moving averages and or a lot of overhead resistance, a lot of trap buyers. Hopefully that makes sense. We'll do some examples. It'll make sense. So sometimes stocks gap up over the entry point, but you can still have a tight stop on it if you do opening range highs. When you have a powerful chart, so look at this setup here. Is it a high tight flag? It's not far off a high tight flag. See this really nice tight trigger bar coming through there? That was a really good setup, by the way. When you have a powerful chart, a gap up is okay. This was a pretty decent setup. He's talking about plug here. So this is your episodic pivot, your EP gap up base breakout. But see how it is basically gapping above all the highs of the base. And it's above all the key moving averages. So don't worry, we'll go into opening range highs for how to trade these EPs a little bit later on. Melly, this one here. So do you see how it's gapping up? It's above all the key moving averages. Stock's building a decent base, pretty much gaps up to the highs of the base here. So it then kind of makes sense because there are going to be trap buyers up here. It's at the top of the base. You'd expect there to be kind of resistance there from actual trap buyers, a bit of psychology as well. It's base highs, resistance, things like that. It takes a couple of days, but didn't take out the lows and then goes on a really nice trend. And that's the first close up here below the... Um, uh, Kuala Manga actually used a 20 day Melly. I bought on earnings here. Then I used the 20 day as my trailing stop. It reported great earnings. I mean, just incredible earnings. I'm filming this currently in May of 2023. Go and take a look at Melly. Ridiculous earnings are still coming through on this uh, on this stock and estimates as well. Crazy. Uh, Shopify. So now we're actually going, going to go into, these are pretty recent. You can see this is actually um, May, which as I said, I'm currently filming this in May 2023. So Shopify, we're going to look at this stock here and we're going to look at it on the one minute chart, the five minute chart and the 60 minute chart for opening range highs on the EPs. But here you can just see visually on the daily chart, what do you see? It's a stock that's building a big range. It's EPing above all the key moving averages to pretty much the highs of the base, trying to EP over the highs of the base. That there is a better setup. Remember here. M phase energy gapping above pretty much the highs of the base above all key moving averages. It's not really gapping into a lot of overhead, overhead resistance. So Shopify, let's now start looking at this and be cognizant of the ADR percentage of 4.29%. Here we go. So gaps up as you'd expect, right? It's an EP on the earnings. So here is the first one minute candlestick. Okay, candlestick, good volume coming through, really good volume coming through, shake out demand tail, decent close, and then it goes tight, tight, tight. And then here it takes out the opening range highs of the first one minute bar, which is $55.94. So your stop is then lows of the day, which is here underneath this bar, which is 53.88. Now, what percentage risk is that? That is 3.68%. What is the ADR percentage of the stock? 4.29%. Is that acceptable risk versus reward? It's pretty darn good, isn't it? It's around two thirds or so, the ADR, which is kind of acceptable. And look at the volume coming through. It's pretty darn good. It's pretty good candle six volume price action going on. Next one, five minute chart. So this is still Shopify, but now we're looking at opening range highs on the five minute chart. So here's the first five minute bar, decent first five minute bar. The high of that bar is $56. So as it takes out that high, that's where you're looking to get in. Initial stops underneath the low of the bar, 5.5388. Uh, so that is gonna be 3.5, 3 3.79%, which is pretty, just under around about eh, it's just over two thirds isn't it versus the adr percentage of the stock okay it's still kind of acceptable acceptable risk now the next one here this is the 60 minute chart but remember this first bar here is actually a 30 minute candlestick so really good first 60 minute bar coming through why gaps up opens near the low little shake out demand tail pushes up really good volume coming through so the high of that bar is 59.31 Stop lower the day 53.88 would be 9.16 percent 
Now, is that a good risk versus reward trade? Look at the ADR. Probably not. Why? Because it's about two times the ADR, which you could think about that as ATR if you want to use average two range instead. Again, the risk versus reward is now out of whack. So on this one here, the one minute chart is in check. Five minute chart, it's in check. One hour chart, out of check. Make sense? Let's do a few more examples. This is another relatively recent one. This is SMCI. The ADR of this stock was 5.77%. So here's the gap through the base highs. See how it's EPing basically to the base highs and trying to take out the base highs and above all the key moving averages. 119.27 was the highs of the base. So one minute chart. So we're going to do one minute, five minute, 60 minute bar. So here's the EP. Now on the first one minute chart, it doesn't actually take out the highs of the base. So I actually think on this one where you could use the highs of the first one minute bar, or you could wait for the highs of the base around 119.24. That's my subjective viewpoint. But let's just go opening range highs for the one minute candlestick to not add too much confusion to this, right? So decent volume coming through, very good volume coming through on a relative basis for the first one minute candlestick. Good, strong close, check out demand tail. The higher that one minute candlestick is 118.22. So opening range high breakout through the high of the first one minute candlestick. That's where you get filled. Stop lows of the day, 114.32. What is that percentage risk? 3.3%. Let's take a look at the ADR percentage. 5.77%. Is it in check? It's in check. Five minute chart. First five minute candlestick coming through. It's okay. It's a doji. There's good volume coming through. High of that bar is 118.76. So stop lows of the day, 114.32. Percentage risk, 3.74%. Is that in check with the ADR? Yes, it is. Check. Next one here. Now we're on to the 60 minute time frame. Okay. First one hour candlestick, is it a good candlestick? Yes, it is. Why? Gap up, powerful candlestick. Look at the volume coming through. Highs of that bar is 128.90. Lows of the day, 114.32. So the stop loss to go lows of the day would be 11.31%. Is that good risk versus reward? Look at the ADR percentage. No, it's about double. It's out of whack again. So one minute chart, good, we're in check. Five minute chart, good, we're in check. 60 minute chart again, out of whack. So again, this is going to be feeding into your strategy for thinking about these things. Let's do another one here, Uber, reps and sets, reps and sets, as Arnold said, that's the best way to teach it. So if you look at Uber here, okay, it's not great in terms of the stock is potentially building a base, but it's kind of been a downtrend, isn't it? Lower lows, lower highs, lower lows, lower highs. It's not great, but something that happens here. Here's the gap up, ADR is 3.6%. Let's go take a look at it. And it's basically EPing into the highs of the base. I think the other two were better than this one because if you just look at the strength, it's kind of EP, trying to EP above the highs of the base. You look at Shopify as well, which is trying to EP above the highs of the base. So I'd say Uber, just on the face of it, at the minute on that kind of gap up is not as strong as some of these other ones, okay? So we're looking at this bar here, okay? So there's no kind of, I'm really putting a high because would you use this high, this high, this high? It's not very clear and obvious. So just the highs of this bar, let's take a look. So one minute chart. What happens? Well, it actually gaps up. The open is up here and then it sells off here. So this is not as good a one minute candlestick as we saw on the other two examples being Shopify and SMCI. Okay, it gaps up, the high is here, sells down to here. Then you get the shakeout demand tail, but the high of this bar is 35.10. Shakeout demand tail, so the low of the, low of the day is gonna be 34.23. So when it takes out the high, your entry is there and then your initial stop is here. Lows of the day, that is a 2.46% stop, which is about two thirds of the ADR, which is 3.6%. Is it acceptable? I'd say it is acceptable. Next slide, five minute chart. So it's um, overall, it's a bearish candlestick, but it, it's not quite a doji. Um, there's a supply sheet, there's a demand tail. But either way, this is the high of the bar. It's on the five minute chart, 35.24. And then lows of the day is 34.20.23. So you've got around about a dollar, dollar stop. So again, if you know you've got about a dollar stop, you can then look at the ATR and go, well, the ATR is one and a half dollars or two dollars or whatever. You could do it that way. As I said, I prefer percentages. My brain just works better with percentages. So stops lows of the day would be 2.86% which again, is about two thirds or so versus the ADR. Okay, still in check, isn't it? Next one for Uber. Well, now we have one where first one hour candlestick is more of a hammer type doji bar. Highs of the bar is 35.24, lows of the day, 34.22. So therefore the initial stop, if we went through the high of the first, first 60 minute candlestick here and then stop lows of the day would be 2.86%. Is this good risk versus what? Well, this time it actually is on the one hour chart, isn't it? Because it's about two thirds versus the ADR percentage. Okay, that's looking a little bit better. Let's now do some EPs. So Roku has three EPs. It actually has four on this chart. 
Let's see if let's see if you can get them. Can you rank them as well? So there's three EPs I really want really want you to focus on. There's four, which is like a dud. I won't even consider it an EP. Ready? Three, two, one. There we go. Did you get them? Did you rank them as well? So I would actually say, for, let's just start with the dud. This one here is a no go, right? Why? Well, it's gapping up. There's going to be overhead resistance because the stock's in a downtrend. It's gapping up into the 50, the 200's there. The gray line is the 100. It's above all. No, 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 no. Okay. This one here. Now, number three, the reason I put it is number three. Well, the stock's not really basing here. It's actually already in an uptrend. So that it's just not as good for, for me. See how it's kind of, it's already been trending up for some months here, around about, what's that, nearly eight weeks or so. It's kind of been trending up. But number two, which I rank second, is it's building a constructive base here. And then it EPs, it EPs above all the key moving averages. There is some overhead resistance. There's quite a big kind of what I call a resistance cluster where price has been trading in this range for some time in here. It's okay, there's gonna be trapped buyers. But why I think number one, why I rank this number one is, well, look at where the stock is finding support of action prior to this earnings. See, it's in a much more established uptrend and it holds here around the 50 SMA. Here it holds around the 50 SMA. Here it's kind of languishing. It actually goes below it, reclaims kind of, kind of uh, a bit sluggish around here. But here it just looks like a much stronger base to me. And then the EP is actually taking out all overhead resistance. It's EPing above the overhead resistance and above the key moving averages. For me, that there is the best one. That there is the best one. Next one. So Melly, there are two setups on this chart. Two setups. One's an EP, one's a continuation type pattern breakout. Can you find them? Three two, one. Here we go. So here's the EP. See how the stock is in an uptrend here. I don't know why there's this red line here. That was probably from the last one. I forgot to say that off. But here you go. It's in an uptrend. Find support on the 10, then on the 21 in here. Tight, tight. And then it goes, takes out this range above all the key moving averages. Good EP, good candle set. Now it does then pull back down. It does find support of action around the 10, which is really good, right? So the stock is now staying above its 21 in here, pulls down, finds support of action around the 10. And then what do you notice? Tight, 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 tight. Quala Mangi's own words. This is a good setup right here. This is a really good setup. Next one. So now we're going into a little bit more of the specifics, actually. So quote from Quala Mangi. Quala Mangi. On some stocks, you don't get good setups. They're just choppy and go higher anyway. So what is a choppy stock? So if you think about what have we been looking for, we've been looking for stocks that are in solid uptrends and have made a smooth move above the key moving averages. Okay. So remember that trend, which can oftentimes start post earnings. So i.e. something material happens and then the trend happens, then it goes in trends along the 10 and the 20 day, maybe the 50 day as well. Right. But it stays above it and it holds it, finds supportive action. What Kuala, what Kuala Maggie's referring to here is a choppy stock is it doesn't respect, it doesn't hold the key moving averages, it just chops around. Now, this is very important. If you've read uh, Livermore's work, if you've read, read um, Darvis's work as well, stocks exhibit personality behaviors. And you may not like, like, what are you on about? No, they do. Stocks just move, different stocks move in different ways. Don't ask me why, I couldn't explain it. They just have personalities. Like I have a personality which you may like or not like, like you have a personality which people may like or not like, but you will have those behavior traits which means in certain situations you will react probably how you did in prior situations. Now that's important to think about when you're looking at a stock, why? Because how has a stock moved previously is to my mind the best indication, how is it gonna act in the future? This is the personality point. If you know someone's personality and you know their behavior and you know how they act in a certain situation, therefore you can try and take advantage of that. Thinking about that as stocks and how do they, how do they move, how do they act? So if you take a look at hubs here, this was one of the can the canceling winners <clears throat> of 2020 and 2021. But see how choppy it is. So remember, you're looking for clean moves along the key moving averages. Whereas here, well, just kind of choppy, 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 choppy. You get any idea? Even up here, it's just choppy, even to the downside. It's pretty choppy. See, it's just it's chopping all, all around all over the place. So if your trade management is going to be, well, I'm going to buy a tight, a, a nice tight breakout from a flag or something like that, and then I'm going to ride it along, say, the 10 or the 20, well, if the stock has a history of just being able to whip back and forth through the 10, 20, you're going to get stopped out really quickly and probably be very frustrated. That's why you want to look back at the previous behavior of the stock. How has it acted? How has it trended? It's a subtle point, but a really, really, really important point, I think. So this one here, this is now talking about sector momentum. So when you have sector momentum, if it's a leading sector and or hot theme, the setup doesn't have to be really, really good. It's okay if it's three and a half star 
or four star setup. It still counts like a five star setup because if everything is running in a sector, there's increased probability of success. Now, this then links back to a couple of questions. How do you identify sector momentum? Well, in essence, you identify multiple stocks within a specific sector and or theme that are making big moves. They are showing momentum. They are building flags. They're building cup and handles. They're building VCPs, whatever. They're trending higher. They're riding their key moving averages. So what I've got here, and these are lined up, you've got Riot and you've got Marathon, both of which are North American crypto miners. So this is where Bitcoin was really running and the market kind of went a little bit crazy, but in the back end of 2020 and then into, into 2021, which is when the growth bear market really started, this was kind of the blow off top for growth stocks. And then it's been a bear market for around about two years or so, um, just over, certainly for growth stocks and more kind of canceling growthy type names. But this year, they may not have been <clears throat> the best setups. I wouldn't really say for Riot or Marathon, either one was really a five star kind of setup. Um, but they were pulling into the 10 and 21 EMA. They were doing it in here as well. You can see it with, um, with Marathon, 10, 21 EMA in here. You can see it in here, see how it goes up, pulls back down, finds support on the 21, tightens up a bit in there. You can see it in here as well. They weren't, I, I wouldn't say any of these are really five star. Some of them are, it's quite like you're saying there in the crowd, three and a half, four star tops, but there was so much momentum here for crypto and crypto stocks. Think about what Bitcoin was doing during this time. I think Cavi Wood was being interviewed um, every day about Bitcoin and price targets and stuff like that. Like there was a lot of momentum in crypto stocks um, there. So on the next slide, we're going to be going into relative strength. Okay, the importance of relative strength, and I'm using Monster Beverage, which built arguably the best kind of volatility contraction pattern you will ever see on the monthly chart, especially given the fundamentals of this stock, where it did it in the con in the context of a bear market as well, and the relative strength that it exhibited, and then the move thereafter as well. So let me tick off a, a couple of points here. The best setups, the best ones, the best setups are those that show relative strength. If you've read the likes of O'Neill's book, you'll know about relative strength that can't go lower even if the overall if even if the market overall or the indexes are showing weakness and going lower these things being the stocks can't go lower maybe even building higher lows you may have heard the adage of the basketball being held underneath water so the stock is the basketball being held underneath water and the water being the market so the market pressure is pushing the stock down but every time that pressure is eased a little bit the stock pops out builds a higher low as the pressure comes back on that's the the proverbial basketball underneath water. If you're not paying attention to relative strength, well, I guess you don't know what you are doing. So see Monster Beverage here, see how it builds this huge base. Think about the cause and effect relationship as well. Now this is the monthly chart. <clears throat> and because this is then um, just the strength this stock exhibited, you can't really see the power of this relative strength line here. But believe me, it was an uptrend as you can see with the 52 week highs coming through. And then do you see the tightness? So remember the concepts that we were talking about and primarily we focus on the daily chart okay stock getting tight around key moving averages it happens on all time frames you can find these setups on the monthly chart the weekly chart the daily chart the one hour chart the five minute chart <coughs> the minute chart whatever chart it is just supply and demand it's all it is it's absolutely timeless so see the tightness that comes through in here now what i do just want to add in here quickly is the power of earnings growth sales growth and margins improving as well okay really really important so sales growth margins growth and also the earnings growth coming in really <coughs> really really important so if you can line up and we'll look at it a little bit later on with a quote if you can line up the technicals with a stock that's showing fantastic relative strength and the fundamentals and potentially the story behind it you can have a very powerful situation so relative strength this is a stock that quite manga was in here this was one of the stocks with the best relative strength in the June, July pullback in the markets. It being the stock barely pulled back. It was back at all time highs in no time. Okay. It's up 900% from the lows. <clears throat> when you have a stock that's up 900% in a few months and the market weakness can't bring it down, the stock is trying to tell you something. It's yelling at you. It's literally yelling, Hey, I want to go higher. If the market weakness stops, I'm going to go higher higher so again this free tool search my name on trading view you'll find it 52 week highs coming through here 52 week highs 52 week highs here's the stock setting up here and if you get 52 week highs while the stock is still basing that is the basketball being held underneath water it is such a good sign of strength if the stock hits 52 week highs whilst it is still basing so what are the type of stocks that Colin Maggie is looking for 
I'm going to show you some of the market Smith charts to illustrate the point. If you're interested in discount trial, there's a link in the comment section below. So I like to trade the stocks with the biggest earnings. They tend to make the biggest moves. But the only thing you really need to focus on is momentum because all of the big earnings winners are going to have momentum. You're going to catch them if you just focus on momentum. You've got to be in the momentum leader. So remember, we were actually looking at um, ON ON. A little bit, a little bit earlier on. I think we were looking at ON a little bit, a little bit earlier on. It's a very strong stock in the market at the minute. It's certainly got my my attention at the time of filming this. Look at the earnings coming through. Four quarters of triple digit earnings. Look at the sales coming through as well. And the sales you have sequential growth. One and a half is that. That's a big word. So you basically have growth on a year over year basis, but also a quarter over quarter basis as well. That's a really good sign to see, especially for the sales. Even better if you can get it for the earnings as well. Then we take a look over here at the estimates. Well, 2023, the estimates for this year. 55% and this little green marker means that the guidance is up. Check. Good. Next year, 2024, 41% with the guidance up. Good. Really good. So the company's gone from earning three cents a share to losing money, five cents a share, to earning two cents a share, to suddenly 30 cents, 47 cents, 66 cents a share with the estimates coming in. That is huge. Show you a couple more. This one here is Shockwave. Now, Kuala Maggie's quote here was he was talking about Lorbongo. Those of you who are trading through um, COVID and were focused on can, can slim names, you'll be really familiar, really familiar with Lorbongo. It no longer trades. I think it was actually bought out by Teladoc, um, I think. So I've used Shockwave Medical, which is kind of another medical-related healthcare stock, um, to kind of illustrate the point that he's making here. These are the kind of stocks you want to be long. The ones that have triple-digit earnings and revenue growth. Look down here. Triple-digit earnings doesn't have triple-digit revenue growth in the most recently reported quarters, but did have a string of those and still 71 72% is very high. This is the reason Lavongo went from like 20 bucks to 150 bucks in four or five months. It then got bought out as well. This is fuel. This is called fuel. Rocket fuel is another word for it. Most stocks I trade are very liquid. BA, Peloton, Tesla. So looking for the liquid leaders. So you take a look here at Shockwave Medical. We said about the earnings being high, triple digits, the sales being high, and then the estimates as well. Next year, especially plus 29% with the guidance up as well. And what chart pattern do you see here? Ooh, cup handle on the weekly chart look at the rs line stock has a history of being able to run interesting got one more for you so this is shopify and we're going to be looking at it in this period in here this is when he was talking about it. look at shop 2020 look at the numbers look at the revenue growth look at the earnings per share growth if you're going to get big moves in a the stock there needs to be a reason for it to go up every stock can go up a short every stock can go up a short amount of time on some random stuff but there needs to be something usually earnings or unexpected earnings is the big driver for long-term moves so if you take a look at shopify here this is quite interesting if you've seen some of the other um recent videos i think it may have been the mini beanie video where i talk about kind of fundamentals and oftentimes with these growth stocks that when the earnings top out the stock tops out the stock actually tops ahead of the earnings topping out it's quite it's quite interesting to see and especially when you kind of think about it from a price cycle perspective so you've got like your phase one phase one base down here so phase one base phase two uptrend phase three top phase four decline into a phase one base and shopify you see this bar here if you remember a couple of slides ago when we were looking at eps on the gap up see this weekly bar here that's actually one of the gap ups that you saw on the earnings even though the earnings were down minus 50 percent. interesting right who knows but looking at this here so we get the relative strength line turning up and then take a look at the earnings coming through. So these are the earnings coming through here. 33%, 100%, 999%, 467%, 300%, 900%, 109%. 100%. Huge earnings are coming through on the stock. Then if we take a look here, so from 2016 to 2021, this is the point that I want to make here. And then look where the stock starts topping out. So the company goes from earning or losing a cent to making two cents, four cents, three cents, to suddenly 2020, 40 cents. Again, it was a little bit of kind of, not necessarily, you wouldn't think of it as kind of classic stay at home, like you would think of like a Zoom and a Peloton and DocuSign, but it was one of the beneficiaries of kind of the, the Corona crisis, I would say. But you can see here, huge change in the earnings, three cents to 40 cents to 64 cents. Then here is the peak. And then what happened in 2022? Four cents. <laughs> Now, it obviously didn't help that there was a bear market and kind of growth stocks as well. But you see the point here that when the earnings top, the stock actually topped. So again, the kind of the, the revenue, the earnings, they are fuel. They are rocket fuel, to use Kuala Maggie's quote from a, from a couple of slides ago. So it's just interesting to pay attention to the earnings. But sometimes you go look at the Zooms, the Pelotons, the APPSs of the world, the DocuSigns of the world. The stock can actually top out when the earnings are at their peak, which can confuse most people, which the market is designed to do. So let's do a little slide on screening. So 
I recommend you do three scans. He's quite a man, he's word. A one month gainer scan, a three month gainer scan, and a six month gainer scan. You don't need any others. On scanning criteria for the one, three, and six month, I use dollar volume, ADR percentage. So that's how, how, um, the percentage move the stock has had on a on an average daily range over the last 20 days. So I'll talk about that in a couple of minutes time rather than confuse you now. And price growth over a period, it needs to be in the top 7% of performers or higher of too many results. So Quadrangle uses TC2000 to do this and you can basically set parameters that you can search for the stock that has made the biggest move over the last three months and then you can set you can set the ranking so you could look at stocks that are and subject to them meeting the other criteria but you could be looking for the stock that's made in the top seven percent of movers and it meets the other criteria so the dollar volume and the adr percentage okay so how what is the um what is the average percentage move the stock has had over the last 20 days say and you also want it to be a top performer why because he's trying to find the strongest momentum stocks in the market if you're using the likes of market smith then you could be looking you could use say three month relative strength um rating as well maybe above 90 or something like that so you're trying to trying to get them um you could be looking for stocks that basically you're basically without trying to confuse you too much you're basically looking for stocks that are liquid that move a lot and have made the biggest moves over the last one month three months and six month period that simple you don't need to confuse it any more than that you want the strongest stocks on any given time frame you don't need any intraday scans all you need to use is the one three and six month momentum scans find the setups by running them after the close then put good setups in a watch list then just watch that watch list that's all you need to do to make millions it's never normally a good thing when you only have one sector that looks good for long setup so i.e when you're doing your scans you would actually like to see stocks from lots and lots of different sectors and groups setting up those patterns, those cup and handles, those flags, those VCPs, those Davis boxes, because that's a better indication that there's a lot of strength in the market. There's a lot of breadth in the market. If you only see, ah, crikey, there's only one or two sectors that look good here, it's probably indicating the market is a little bit weak underneath the hood, especially if it's kind of in an uptrend or potentially very long in, in an uptrend. I follow price action. You, you can have opinions, but they need to be loosely held. If price is disproving your opinion, you need, you follow price, not your opinion. That's the key. Problem is most people do it the other way way around that's not a recipe for success for a trader our job is not to predict our job is to listen if you want the adr formula by the way i've got it down here and that's the 20 day um AD, adr formula if you want to copy that into tc2000 if you want if it's a slow adr stock then it's you shouldn't be trading it low adr stock is equal to high adr stock is equal to gold so now we are going into the controlling. So that there was the identify section. You'll be happy to hear that the control and the mitigate and the optimize section is not as long as the identification section. That was the longest by far. And I've also, I've already covered parts of the, um, certainly the controlling and the optimizing profits, thinking about trailing along, along key, along key moving averages, the optimize will get into it. So control. These are some quotes I'm going to give, as we did with the identifying section, I'm going to give you some quotes to kind of kind of outline things and then we're start, going to start going into it. So the stop is always lows of the entry day. Remember with the opening opening range high breakouts, the stop shouldn't be higher than the average true range of so the ATR. It's easier to look at the ATR versus the average daily range for when you're doing your stops. The ATR is the intraday range. It doesn't account for gaps. As I explained earlier, I prefer using the ADR percentage. My mind just works better with percentages instead of fixed kind of numbers. I know they're both numbers. For me, I prefer the ADR percentage. If you want to experiment with the ATR percentage, ADR instead of the ADR, use that. Whatever works best for you in essence. Don't overcomplicate it. I usually don't buy the stock if it's up more on the day than it's ATR. Preferably you want to get in when the stock is only up a third, a half or two thirds, it's ATR. Remember we were looking at that with the opening range highs and saying, is this a good risk versus will trade? My stop are usually around half the ADR, ATR, they are rarely full ATR. I always feel as though I'm chasing when the stock is near full ATR. Responding to what caused blowing up the account four times early in his trading career, lack of strategy, lack of setups. So basically, lack of risk control, didn't know what the hell he was doing. Get used to losing, get used to being stopped out. The best traders are the ones that can take the best losses. I've got one more slide of quotes and then we'll get into some examples. If you catch big moves that are multiples of your risk, you're going to make a lot of money risking very little. It's all about having tight stops and big winners and obviously a lot of small losses. It's all about risk reward. Trading is about getting big multiples on your initial risk. Hopefully these kind of 
quotes on controlling risk are giving you a real insight into how Colin Maggie thinks about trading and his strategy. I've had trades where I've made 50 times my initial risk and more on parts of my shares. That's what it's all about. My win rate last year, 2019, was like 25%, and yet I was wildly profitable. Even this year, 2020, which is my best year by far, my win rate is well below 35%. So this is one of the best traders ever whose win rate is 25% and 35% less what well, like coming in average like high 20 percent tops isn't that really interesting that's probably just kind of change your mindset around thinking that you don't need to have 50 percent win rate 60 percent win rate 70 80 percent win rate the whole point is not to try and be right all the time the whole point is to take very small losses in relative proportion to where you're targeting and achieving your average gain small losses big winners that's what you're shooting for so we've got a couple of examples i've got one, which is stop under the pivot, which is a little bit more conventional um, to just kind of illustrate the point to you. And then I've got two, which are opening range highs. So we'll talk about this one. What chart pattern do you see? But the VCP, isn't it? One contraction, two contraction, three contraction. This on the one hour chart as well. I can take these small losses all week long. That's my trading. I had a 25% win rate last year, 2019. And yet I made like over 100%. It's all about small losses, big wins, small losses, big wins. Don't get into the cult of thinking you have to be profitable every day. No, you don't. What you need to do is have some really big home run trades and keep the losses small in the meanwhile. That's my philosophy. So you see here, one contraction, two contraction, three contraction. See how it holds the key moving averages. Look at the tightness. Look how the volume dries up. So this one here, let's just imagine that the ATR of this stock, so this will be the one where I show you ATR, okay? Then I'm going to go back to ADR. I just prefer ADR. So ATR. Let's imagine that the ATR of this stock is a dollar. So your initial stop loss is going to be 50 cents. Okay. So imagine that you are buying it around $20. Okay. Let's just imagine, I know it's not quite, but imagine your entry is at $20 and then your stop is going to be at $19.50. Now this is more of the kind of conventional O'Neill Minervini way of being underneath, underneath the pivot. So I want to show you this example that you're probably more familiar with. And then I'll show you the opening range high examples on the next two slides. So imagine here. Our stop loss could then go underneath the low of this final contraction, which ties in with being underneath two of the key moving averages. And let's say our stop is 50 cents. So we're buying it at $20, which I know is not quite $20. And our initial stop is going to be $19.50. I know it's not quite $19.50, but let's imagine that's 50 cents. And let's say the ATR of the stock over the last 20 days or 20 bars is a dollar. So we are half the ATR for our initial stop is half the ATR. Is that a good risk versus reward kind of checks and balances? Yes, it is. And then here, imagine if you held for the first close below the 10. This is a 10 email on the one hour chart. So imagine that you got stopped here at around about $24.50. Uh, and imagine you did it on your whole position. That would be about nine times your initial risk. You would have sold part of your position on the first couple of bars, so three to five bars. We'll talk about that. So let me give you some examples. You remember this ONON, so on. And I've got one on the one minute chart and then one on the five minute chart as, um, as well. So looking at this one here, do you now start to see how you are thinking about the the risk that you are taking thinking it thinking about it in terms and this is what i kind of did earlier but i've now shaded it red to think about how large is your stop relative to either the adr percentage in this instance here it's 4.75 percent for the um for the candlestick on the day and it would be 1.89 percent initial stop because you're buying it through the highs of the first one minute candlestick stop lows of the day 1.89 percent relative to 4.75 percent that's a nice metric there to be to be thinking about. Okay, so tight stops, and then you're looking for the big winners. Tight stops relative to how the stock is trading, because 1.89% on say like we looked at Oracle, which had an ADR of 1.33%, then that risk reward it would be out of whack. It wouldn't be kind of checks and balances coming through. If we do another one, so you see this grey shaded area. This is how we're kind of then thinking about the controlling risk. I did kind of cover this off earlier on in the video as well. But see here the initial stop. Well, through the high, opening range highs, 30.87 stops, lows of the day, 29.98, that would be 2.88%. So 2.88% relative to the ADR. Is that good risk versus what? Yes, it's looking pretty, pretty constructive. Let me do another one here for you. So remember that quote by Livermore. Men, traders who can both be right and sit tight are uncommon. Livermore was all about playing for the home run. Certainly later on in his career, when he was making oodles and oodles of money, it was about sitting tight. It was about getting the big money, sitting in the home run trade. So here you go, this Cabba, this is from late 2022 into 2023. So the stock moves up here, look at the volume coming through, pulls back down. Where does it find support? On that black line, the 10 day, and then it pulls back down, find support where? 
black line 10 day and then you get that trigger bar coming through and then from here imagine if you went stop low at the trigger bar day instead of opening range highs then from here, your risk would be around about 14 cents and the return was $8.88 before it closed below the 21 EMA. The first close below the 10 day was up here, the 10 EMA being this bar here, which still would have been pretty darn good. But before it closed below the 21, and I'm gonna show you some stats a little bit later for why I personally use the 21 uh, EMA and why you continue to sit on the charts. 63 times the initial risk. They are the kind of ones you are looking to take. It goes up about 423%, I think. So with swing trading, you're looking to get 5, 10, 20, 30 times your initial risk. The best trades you'll make 20, 30, 50 times your initial risk. You can make a lot of money even if you have a 20, 30% win rate. My win rate last year, 2019, was 22, 25%, something like that. This year, 2020, it's maybe a bit better, maybe closer to 30%. You can have a win rate well below 50% 50 and make a ton of money. If you need a 70, 80, 90% win rate to make money, I'm sorry, but your setups suck. Your methods suck. You are very little to ledge if you need that higher win rate to wake to make money next slide so now we're going into control but thinking about position sizing you shouldn't put more than 25 percent of your account in any given stock ever there's no point you get the best breakouts in bull markets and in a bull market you get hundreds of stocks that make big moves you can very easily make a lot of money risking just 0.5 percent of total account equity per trade i rarely risk more than 0.5 percent on any trade and i'm up like 120 percent on the year being march 2021 Nowadays, I rarely risk more than 0.5% of my account on any trade. But when I had a smaller account, I consistently risk like 1-2%. 1% of total account equity is a lot of risk. So hopefully you're getting a good kind of feel for how much Kuala Magi is risking per trade. I'm risking 03 to 0.5% of my total account per trade. I'm taking smaller risks than I used to, but I'm going for big multiples of risk. If I don't think I can realistically make, say, 10 times my initial risk, I'm probably not gonna take the trade. Many of my swing longs, I can make 20, 30, 50 times my initial risk. Now we're gonna go on to the risk mitigation part. So we've looked at identify, we've looked at control, we're now onto risk mitigation. For this method, you don't need to scale in. You can buy everything at once, but you need to scale out. Sell one third or one half of your position after three to five days and then use the 10 day moving average as your trailing stop. Then when the stock closes below the 10 day, you sell the rest. So we've got AMD and we've got four different entry examples here. Okay, the black arrow is gonna be the entry. The green is gonna be when you sell part in the first three to five days. So one third, one half of your position and then you'd move your stop to break even. And then the red is gonna be the exit, either stopped out or exit because it closed below the key moving averages. So see, this would be a breakout entry here. See how tight it got in here. And then you sell one third, one half of your position after three to five days, move your stop loss to break even and then you get stopped out here. here See how tight it gets in here? Here's the breakout. So one third, one half of your position, three to five days afterwards, and then you get stopped out here. Tightens back up. Here's the entry, and then you get stopped out here. Then it makes a big move. Here's the entry. Here's where you sell three to five, and then here's where you get stopped out here. Hopefully that's giving you a little bit of an example. Hopefully it's a bit of common sense as well. Now we're moving into the optimizing profits phase. Okay, we kind of touched upon the um, the, the risk mitigation part. I, I think it's Pretty, pretty straightforward what Colin Maggie is saying. He's saying basically sell the one third to half of your position after three to five days, move your stop to break even. That ain't rocket science, is it? So optimize. After three to five days, you sell one third to one half of your shares. Then you move your stop to break even. Then use the 10 day moving average as your trailing stop. That's what we are just looking at on the previous slide. Good quote here. Extended stocks get more extended. The whole point of swing trading is giving the stocks room to move. In day trading, you're always near your entry, always fighting near your entry. Swing trading, you've just got to let things work out, i.e. give the stock time to trend. And this is kind of slightly into the mindset part of things, which we'll come on to later. It's better to sell a partial a little bit too late than too early. Better to sell 10% too late than 100% too early. So this it. Now, this is the actual data table that feeds into these results here, but obviously I cannot show this in clarity that you can actually read the figures. So here is a print screen of it. Here is here is the um, the result. So this is my own test, my own data series. So I looked at 500 of these stocks and I used the 10 EMA and the 21 EMA and I wanted to know from these these flags, these pennants, these wedges, these VCPs, these cover handles, these Darvis boxes, these breakouts, how far do the stocks move? And I looked at 500 of them, okay? So what I have here is I eyeballed the initial stop loss. Now, for me, I tend to go low. I go low the trigger bar day invariably and try and tie that in with being underneath one or more, one or more key moving averages. That's just me. So for these 500 trades, 
the average stop loss came in at 4.95%, which is pretty much what I would be expecting to come in. So that's nice, sub sub 5% there. That's what I was kind of expecting. And again, I was just kind of eyeballing it for where would I have this obviously done in hindsight of looking back at the setup, where would I place my stop loss, so on and so forth. But about 5%, is where I would have expected it to come in pre kind of the data anyway. So then I looked at, okay, what was the average percentage move before it closed below the 10 EMA? 28.82%. What was the average percentage move before it closed below the 21 EMA? 42%. So what was the average risk versus reward if you were using the initial stop before the stock closed below the 10 EMA? 5.71. For the 21 EMA, 7.82. So for me and my own personal trading, and I would encourage you to do to do your own study. Study. I would I'm sure that Kuala Maggie would tell you to do your own study and do your own research as well. I use a combination. That's why I've been talking about throughout this presentation. I use a combination of the 10 EMA and also the 21 EMA for part of my position on a close below the 10 EMA, part of my position on a close below the 21 EMA. It does somewhat depend on the individual stock and it does depend if the stock got really extended. I will then invariably go lower the bar, lower the bar, lower the bar on part or all of my position. But I don't wanna make this video too much about me, but I did wanna show you this data table here as I think it's interesting, sheds a little bit more light as well. And now what I wanna show you is some optimize, some simulations. So as we've been making quite clear throughout this thing, Kuala Maggi sits for the home run trades. He thinks sitting is really, really, really important as we're gonna call him Jeff down here is sitting and he's quite stunned by these results. So let's do some quotes, then I'll take you through these simulations. Sometimes the hardest thing to do is hold a big winner. It's so hard sometimes, incredibly hard. If you want to make big money, you have got to be in the fast moving stocks. So I'm gonna take you through some different scenarios here. So we've got sitting, okay? Sitting one, sitting two, sitting three, and sitting four. What we're saying is the starting account balance is 100 grand. There's 250 trades. These metrics do not change. The position size is gonna be 12% of total account equity. That's not the risk, that's the position. So with 100 grand, you're putting 12 grand into, in, into the setup. It's then obviously compounding on top of that as well. Your win rate is gonna be 40%, okay? Which out of your 250 trades means you're gonna have 150 losing trades and 100 winning trades. And then for this instance, we're gonna say that the average loss is 10%. So you've got 150 losing trades with an average loss of 10%. So what I really wanna do here is get you thinking about different uh, different kind of metrics and why you are doing potentially what it is you are doing in terms of your strategy. Where are you targeting your average gain? Why are you doing it? What are your sell rules about? What are you trying to achieve there? What does the math actually indicate? What is more optimal? Is it optimal to try and sit for big moves? Is it better to take lots and lots of, of small winners and have really, really small losses? Let's take a look. So average loss 10% and you're gonna have of your 100 winning trades with your 40% hit rate, 80 winning trades, average gain 5%, basically nothing, okay? But you're gonna have some big winners. 10 winning trades of a 50% gain, 10 winning trades of a 100% gain. Over the course of these 250 trades, at the end, you return 47%. Okay, now the only metric we're gonna change from sitting one to sitting two is we're gonna bring your average loss down from 10% to 5%. Now suddenly you return 264%. See how losses and keeping your average loss low, so 5% instead of 10%, you've added over 200% to your to your return over the course of 250 trades. Then compound that out over 10 years and see what you get to. Interesting. Sitting three, we're gonna mix it up a little bit, okay? The only difference that we're gonna do now from sitting two is we're just gonna say, instead of your 80 winning trades averaging a 5% gain, we're gonna be a little bit more generous. They're gonna come in at a plucky 8%. Okay, so you now have 80 winning trades of 8%, 10 winning trades of 50%, and 10 winning trades of 100%. But this is the only metric. You now add another 100%, just from bumping up from 5% to 8%. And obviously, it's not gonna come in perfect 8% on 80 winners. You're gonna have some that come in at 2%, 8%, 15%, 25%, 2%, 3%, 9%, 17%, 21%. Okay, I'm just using this as an average to illustrate this is really important to actually understand the maths and reverse engineer the process. I'm a big believer in reverse engineer the process. Okay, where do you wanna to get to in the end? Reverse engineer it, build the strategy to get you to where you want to go to. Really simple. Sitting number four. Now, the only thing we're gonna change from sitting three to sitting four is we are gonna say you now get two monster gains. Okay, you get a one gain of 500% and you had 12% of your account in it. And you get one gain of 700% and you had your account in it. Now, if you're trading the quickest momentum stocks, I don't think out of 250 trades, that is unreasonable to think that you could have two extremely big gains. I don't think that's unreasonable. If you are focusing on the real momentum leaders in the market, I don't think that's an unreasonable expectation. After your 250 trades, you keep your average loss at 5%. 
your return is quadruple digits, 1,037%. So now if you ever wondered, well, how do I get to a triple digit year? What do I actually need to do over the course of say 250 trades? What do I need to do to get a thousand percent return? Because I'm a big believer in if you can see the goal, if you can see it and you can think about it and you can build a strategy to get there, you're much more likely to get there. This is the reverse engineering process. Okay. And this is why doing these videos like this, where you really actually go into the systems and the processes. Well, how on earth did Kuala Maggi turn five grand into a hundred million? You're starting to see it's getting the big winners. He did not do it like this in not sitting one and not sitting two, where over here we're saying, okay, average loss, it's same 250 trades, 40% win rate, average loss 5%, and then 100 winning trades, 10%. That returned 34%. He wasn't playing for the 10% gainers. He's playing for the home runs. He's coming in down here, okay? This is where he's coming in. He's sitting for the big winners. The big winners have an exponential effect on your bottom line, as the quotes earlier were saying on. Not sitting two, now we're just changing it. Average loss is staying 5%, but the 100 winners is 15%, so they're three to one trader instead of a two to one trader in terms of risk, in terms of risk versus reward or reward, reward to risk, however you want to think about it. Then the return is 141%. But to get where Kuala Maggi is coming in, okay, in terms of if you actually think about the last eight years, so you take out the, the first two years where he lost 95% and around about 50%, which then had an average um, average annual return of about 268%. Well, he's coming in somewhere here, isn't he? Around 264%. If you look at the last eight years, he's actually coming in closer to 350%. So this is kind of what the results are looking like. Now, the win rate is a little bit low. He'll have some, again, this is kind of in terms of the maths here, it's not gonna come in this perfectly, but hopefully you're understanding the point that I'm trying to illustrate getting the big trades right now and then makes a monumental difference. Here's the maths behind the returns to really try and help you. A couple of scenarios here. So you can see that we'll say Jeff was on the last side. This is Jesse here. Jesse's very happy. Why? Because Jesse is sitting in winners. So scenario one, scenario two, scenario three, scenario four. I don't want to bore you too much, but scenario four, the 10 trader compounded return on investment is 55.9%. Okay. relative to say scenario two and scenario one, where it's 33.95% with a 50% win rate for 14% winners, 7% losers. Scenario two, 40% win rate, 14% winners and 7% losses. So they are two to one in terms of their gain versus their loss, 9.27%. But look at this, look at the monumental difference here, 55.9%. Why? The outsized gain here. 50% win coming in, and then the other ones, okay, 15% gains, okay, but 10% and 5%, okay, nothing burgers, but then controlling the rest, three, 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 five, 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 small losses, big winners, small losses, big winners, here's the math, here's why it's really important, a couple of quotes, two slides on quotes, which hopefully help illustrate this point, so when I feel a stock is getting extended, I'm not going to wait to trail it with the 10 day moving average, but a lot of times, that's actually a mistake, and you may have heard Kuala Maggi talk in um, podcasts, and it was chat, chat with traders um he actually found that uh, sometimes he thinks he can kind of out he can outsmart his moving averages um but he actually says oftentimes it's a mistake i should just stuck with with the with the 10-day moving average rule use the close below the 10-day moving average as a trailing stop for at least one third or maybe half of your position the logic behind trailing with the 10-day moving average these home these home runs, you catch a few of these, you're going to make a lot of money as those simulations were just showing you. And this is what great swing trading versus, and this is what is great with swing trading versus day trading. You don't have to sit there and scout for stupid small moves, sit around your entry, constantly looking for new trades, new action. You can just sit in it and have patience, i.e. sit in the position. Obviously, it's easier said than done, but there's a lot of logic behind all of these things because they work. This is something you'll figure out once you look at thousands of stocks, thousands of leading stocks, big movers, how they act around moving averages and how to develop sell rules. So this is all based on how do stocks act, actually studying the stocks. These moving averages work. The 10 day is an incredibly good moving average for the biggest momentum stock. It works so well. It's not perfect, but it works really well. One more slide on optimize, then we're into mindset. So quote, letting winners run is the hardest thing ever. So letting winners run is the hardest thing ever. That's why you need to study. I keep saying this, you need to spend hundreds and hundreds of hours studying big winners over many different market cycles. Take the time, you'll realize that stocks can ride the 10, 20, 50 day moving averages for big, big moves. Educate yourself, know how the market operates. It's the same thing over and over. These moving averages, the 10 and 20 day, if you look at the biggest momentum stocks, no matter where you look at the market leaders, you can look at the market leaders from the 90s, the 80s, the 50s, the 20s, they move the same way, they obey the same moving averages. The 10, 21, 
50 and 200 day moving averages. They've worked for 100 years and they're probably going to work for another 100 years. Interesting. Now we're going to go into the mindset. And I actually, if any of you know me, know I'm a big football fan. I'm actually a Liverpool fan, so I don't know why I put Marcus Rashford here. But you'll note his celebration. And you'll see a lot of football players doing this, actually. Um, Darwin Nunes scored a couple of weeks ago. The new, new Liverpool striker did this, this celebration here. Now, this is really interesting. When I see, again professional trading is not dissimilar to being a professional athlete, whether that is a basketball player, a football player, whatever it may be. The mental side of it, your mindset is absolutely crucial. And any of you know who Marcus Rashford is will know he has been through, I don't want to go into the story kind of too much, um, but he, he has been through a lot in terms of mentally challenging things, including missing a penalty at the Euro at the Euro 2020 finals um, and then being the victim of a lot of racist abuse as well. And again, I, I sometimes think it's hard having a small YouTube channel. If you are a global megastar in terms of a football player and you constantly have people talking absolute nonsense about you, mentally it must be so difficult. So what I find really interesting with Marcus Rashford, uh, he is on absolute fire at the minute, um, playing fantastically well, bat and just, and just back to his best. But the celebration, mental, focus, 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 focus. Go and study the, thing, the things he's been doing. So mentally just really focusing on himself and his whole game has improved um, significantly. As he was, he's been in some really hard places. I actually really like Marcus Rashford as a, as a human being as well. I think he does a lot, of, a lot of good things, but it's interesting you see these top athletes doing this, the mental side, trading is something different. Making millions in trading is not about rocket science. It's all about patience and discipline. What most people don't have is the patience, the temper, just waiting and doing nothing. Most people want the fix, being the action. They need to be doing something all the time. On being asked what a stop might do in a few sessions, I don't think anything. So again, Crackle Mind is not predicting, oh, does this or does this? Just listening to the market, focusing on the market. My trading affects my feelings outside of the market. I can relate to that. But my feelings outside of the market never affect my trading. There's no point having any opinions about this or that. You've got to wait for price to tell you. Price is the only thing that pays, nothing else. Me personally, I just want to push my trading size to infinity. Every year, I want to increase my trading size. Every year, I want to get better and bigger. I've done it successfully for many years now. You have to push yourself. That last quote is so empowering. That gives you a real insight into Kuala Magi's mindset. How empowering is that? Think about that. Think about his objectives. Think about his mindset that he wants to push his trading size. He wants to get better. He wants to get bigger. He wants to push himself. That there is a much more empowering mindset than many of you may have. Really think about your mindset. Why are you doing what it is you're doing? I can't believe how many people I've unfollowed on Twitter because of their bearishness. I started trading here in May 2012. Here. And the market keeps on going up and going up. Ever since I joined Twitter and started listening and reading financial news media, all of these bears, they always they always talk about what can go wrong, but no one ever talks about what can go right. It's so stupid. Yes, there will be bear markets along the way. Yes, there will be corrections. Shortly after I started trading, the Nasdaq corrected 20% in a few weeks. That's it, 20% correction in here. Just looks like a blip now, doesn't it? Yes, eventually there will be a bear market, but what good is it to call a buy in market if you're wrong for five, 10 years? It's just so stupid. Only thing one really needs to do is follow the price. So here's where Carlo Maggi started. He was then where the growth market, the um, bear market, well, the bear market actually really started kind of around here in Q1 of um, 2021 for growth stocks. And then the market later topped out later in 2000 and, uh, 2021. All these worthless opinions, all these experts, no one knows nothing. No one really knows anything. So yes, the market is currently then being in a bear market. But what follows bear markets? bull markets. What followed this bear market? Bull market. What followed this bear market? Bull market. What will follow this bear market? Bull market. What followed the 2020 bear market, albeit it was short-lived? A really, really, really good bear market. Another one on mindset. This is interesting as well. Then we're going to go into deliberate practice and actually think about how you can get better. How did Kuala Magi get so good at trading? Even the most successful traders are going to be in a drawdown most of the time. I think it's Robert Frey um, or something like that found the S&P 500 in YouTube. It. The S&P 500 is actually in a drawdown of, I think, more than 15 percent, about 70 percent, uh, if not 75 percent of the time, which is quite interesting. Even this year, even though I'm up at least 500 percent, this is 2020, I've spent at least half of the year in a drawdown. 
So 2020, Kualamagi at this point is up 500% and half the year he's been in a drawdown. At least expecting to be at peak equity all the time, it's just not going to happen. You're going to spend most of your time in a drawdown, even on a really good year. That's just how it works. You need to realize it and accept it. Being in a drawdown is normal. So just on, remember on the last side about the acceptance, just listening to the market, but also just accepting the reality of trading as well. A lot of acceptance going on here. Being in a drawdown is normal. I try to limit my drawdowns to 10, 15%. I think I've had two 30% drawdowns this year, being 2020. If you want big returns, you are going to have to have drawdowns. If you don't have drawdowns, it means you, you don't take any risk. And if you don't take any risk, you won't have returns. So then he talks about Amazon here. Look at Amazon, this on the monthly chart for Amazon. It's one of the most amazing stocks ever. History of the world. It's up circa 200,000%. I actually think from the low here to the high here is like 270,000% um, gain. Obviously, this is kind of split adjusted and stuff like that as well. Um, look at the amount of time it's been in a drawdown. At one time, it was in a drawdown for 10 years. Here it is. It's in a drawdown built high lows for 10 years. Out of the 23 years it's been public, it's been in a drawdown for about 15 years. So Kuala Maggi was then looking at this, I think around about this time up um, up here. So maybe it was close to 200% 200 rather than the absolute peak here. But this is the point. Look at the move Amazon's made, 200,000%. And for 15 years out of the 23 years, it's been in a drawdown. These kind of red zones here, it's been in a drawdown. It's been in a drawdown. You can go look at the same for Netflix, Apple, Microsoft, whatever stock you want to look at. Okay, but Amazon's a really good example. Stock that's gone up 200,000%, 15 out of 23 years, it's been in a drawdown. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Deliberate practice. So, deliberate practice, if you've followed me for a while, will know I'm a big, big proponent of deliberate practice. So, if you want to read a good book, Anders Ericsson Peak, The New Science of Expertise, I think is the um, kind of the motto under underneath it. But Anders Ericsson Peak, it's a really good book on deliberate practice, especially I'm a parent. And for me, trying to teach um, my daughter things, and especially because she is a toddler, to do deliberate practice, understand deliberate practice, actually skill acquisition, how do people learn things? I actually think it's um, fascinating. And it goes back to Arnold's thing of if you want to, if you want to grow muscle, Reps and sets, reps and sets. There's, there's no shortcut. Reps and sets, feedback loops, okay? Reps and sets, feedback loop. So there is a difference between knowledge and skill, okay? Trading ultimately is a skill set, okay? It's not a knowledge quiz, it's a skill set. With deliberate practice, your goal is knowledge, but most importantly, skill acquisition. So yes, you are trying to learn, you're trying to improve your knowledge, but you have to understand there is a difference between knowledge and skill. Okay, knowledge and skill, as I tried to differentiate here with this is a proverbial brain, right? You have skill on the left hand side, knowledge on the right hand side. Don't quite work like that, but knowledge and skill are two separate things. So how do you improve your knowledge? And it, we're now specifically talking about trading. How do you improve your knowledge on trading? Well, you can watch YouTube videos like this. You can read books, you can go to seminars, you can read courses. There's probably other things you can think of, but these are kind of the main four, right? That's gonna improve your knowledge not necessarily your skill. Let me put this into context. Imagine you play golf, basketball, whatever, right? Some sport. Do you think your skill being your handicap, we're talking about golf, do you think your skill being your handicap at golf would improve if you only watch YouTube videos, read books, and visualize success? Did you just have a little light bulb moment there? Okay. Do you think your skill, your handicap at golf would improve if you only watch YouTube videos, read books, and visualize success? because that's what a lot of people do with trading. I'm gonna watch this YouTube video, I'm gonna read these books, I'm gonna read more books, okay? It's kind of like self-help porn in a way, right? You just get more and more and more. You think you need more and more and more knowledge. You need more knowledge, more knowledge, more knowledge. No, you need more skill. You need more skill, okay? A lot of you will have, especially by the end of this video, hopefully you have a really good baseline knowledge. And you've, this probably isn't the only trading video you've ever watched, right? You probably have really good knowledge already, but it's now the skill acquisition. It's the skill side that you need to work on. So you have knowledge and then you have skill. And I see this all the time. People go like self-help pornography, like they just love it. They just think uh, the answer to this, the answer to me getting better at something is more information, more knowledge, more information, more knowledge. No, it's skill. You could read every book you could possibly read on golf or swimming. You won't get better at golf or swimming. Your knowledge will improve, but you won't actually get better at it. So down here, I love this, this my own quote. You can't learn to swim reading a book. I have a two-year-old that I'm trying to teach to swim. 
okay? I could show Ella a book of swimming, his front crawl, his doggy paddle, his breaststroke. She ain't gonna get better at swimming. How's she gonna get better at swimming? She gets in the pool, reps and sets, and she gets feedback. I help, I instruct, try this, try that, try that. Have you tried this? Obviously, it's a little bit different when you're talking to a two-year-old, but hopefully you're understanding the point. So how can you actually get skill acquisition at trading? How can you improve your skill set once you have the baseline knowledge? You need the baseline knowledge. I'm not saying knowledge is not important. Knowledge is very, very, very important, but you need the knowledge stacked with the skill set. Knowledge and skill set is what you're looking for. So most of you are really focused over here. You're focused on the knowledge. I need more YouTube videos. I need more books. I need more seminars. I need more courses. Okay, to an extent, but now you need the skill acquisition. So how do we improve your skill set at trading? Let's have a look. So studying historical setups and annotating charts. Thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of them. Train your pattern recognition. It's the same patterns. Livermore told you it's the same patterns. Kuala Maggie's telling you it's the same patterns. Dan Zanger's telling you it's the same patterns. Minavini's telling you the same patterns. I'm telling you it's the same patterns. Everyone, William O'Neill's telling you the same patterns. Darvis is telling you it's the same patterns. Stan Weinstein's telling Everyone is telling you it's the same patterns. But you have to read that. Why? In a hundred different books that everyone's telling you it's the same patterns. Go study the patterns, really ingrain it, internalize it. Build your own chart model database with thousands of specific setups. What is your specific setup? And you may find your own new setup. You may be, well, crikey, actually what I've realized is when a stock has its earnings and then after the earnings, invariably it will pull back down 20 to 30%. And actually it can, the first close below the 21 EMA and then recovery when it's this type of candlestick leads to this move. You may create your own setup or something like that. Or maybe you're kind of like Charles Harris. So Charles Harris will do pullback buys, what that he calls an upside reversal. So a stock that's in a strong uptrend that meets ideally the can cancelling criteria, then he's looking for what I would call a gap down reversal bar or shake out demand tail around the key moving averages, such as 21 EMA or the 50 SMA. So it's a different type of setup. But how did he come up with that setup? He studied the market. He studied how stocks act. So all of these traders that you're reading books about, you're watching in YouTube videos and so on and so forth, or you're going to their seminars, you're buying their courses, they all studied the market. They studied stocks deliberately and came up with their setup. It's now time for you to study it and come up with your own setups. I know I'm ranting at you, but sometimes that's the best way to coach it. Then what I think you need to do is bar by bar sessions. So you've hopefully seen some of those on the channel. Bar by bar. Go bar by bar. Now, you're not going to have the kind of emotions associated with real trading. I think doing both is important. But if you want to get a lot of reps and sets in, a lot of feedback, so remember, deliberate practice is trying to create feedback loops. So you're doing the activity, so being trading. This is applicable for bar by bar sessions where you're going through bar by bar, you can't see the next bar, and you're trying to identify setups in real time. You're thinking about where is your entry price? How are you initially looking to control the risk? How are you looking to mitigate the risk? How are you then optimizing profits, logging your results? So by the logging your results, you're then analyzing your trade. So you're getting feedback. The more instant your feedback, the better. So if you think about when you're at the golf course at a driving range, okay, if you're having a one-to-one -one lesson with a pro or you've got someone watching you or someone's filming you or even even just filming yourself in your swing, okay, what are you doing? Let's just say you have, you have your iPhone there or your iPad or whatever, you've taken it along, you put it behind you in the bay. This will probably make no sense if you're not a golfer, but you're filming yourself take your golf swing. Now, why on earth would you film yourself take your golf swing? Why would you do that? You're trying to create feedback for yourself because you go, hmm, at the minute, I'm hitting a slice. I'm hitting a slice and I don't know why I'm hitting a slice. I know, let me film and then I'll watch my swing back and I'll try and identify why I'm hitting a slice. So what you're then doing is you're creating feedback for yourself. Make sense? So you've done the activity, you've now created feedback for yourself, you are analyzing the feedback and then you are putting in rules and ideas to try for the next activity, being the next golf shot. So activity, feedback, implementation of new ideas and rules to improve desired performance, then you redo the activity. Feedback loops, feedback loops, like this, okay? Feedback loops. That is what you're trying to create with your own trading. So you can do far more trades doing the bar by bar sessions, okay? In the space of, if you did an hour bar by bar session, you can probably take, I don't know, 50 trades, something like that. How many, how long would it take you to do 50 trades in real time and then get the feedback on those trades as well? So again, we're trying to speed up your skill set, okay? how quickly you can acquire skills. 
as Arnold said, reps and sets, reps and sets, reps and sets. So I think the bar by bar stuff, you won't get kind of the emotion of, oh, I got money on this, da, 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 da. But in terms of actually creating skill sets around trading, thinking about entry setups, controlling risk, mitigation of risk, and then the optimizing profits is going to be important for that part. It's not going to help you so much with the emotional control. So deliberate practice is very deliberate in different areas of your trading where you're trying to improve your skill set. Okay, so it's not necessarily all encompassing. So with you, with golf, for instance, okay, it's very hard to work on your putting whilst you're working on improving your seven iron or improving your three wood or improving your driver. You would have deliberate practice sessions for each specific area. So you can have deliberate practice sessions for how you are deliberately trying to improve upon specific areas of your trading. So say if you're a basketball player, I'm a huge, you can probably sit over my... um shoulder here somewhere you can see kobe bryant rest in peace i um i absolutely love kobe and michael michael jordan's up there as well interesting michael jordan had adhd um he didn't know it when he was playing with the chicago bulls as far as i'm aware which is quite interesting um but either way when they're practicing their game they're practicing specific parts of their game okay i'm practicing the layup so okay i'm practicing my jump out i'm practicing my, my my free throws okay whatever whatever it may be i'm practicing my dribbling with my weak hand so your deliberate practice sessions you've really got to think about yourself as kind of an athlete but this is then hopefully a huge mindset mindset shift for you that you probably have a lot of knowledge you probably have a lot of trading knowledge. This is probably not the first YouTube video you've ever watched. You've probably watched hundreds of YouTube videos, read tens and book, tens of books, if not hundreds of books on this, gone to Sen and Moore's, bought courses, but have you really improved? And if you haven't improved, why haven't you improved? It's because your skill set has not improved. We've really got to work on your skill set, improving your skill set. And then a lot of it also, Dan's anger quote, is right trader, right mentality, right market environment. As we started off earlier on in this presentation, the right market environment is very important for whatever strategy you're trading. Okay, whether that be value investing or whether it be, as we've covered in this video, which is a momentum breakout strategy. The environment you find yourself in is very, very, very important, but that part of it as well is skill, knowing am I in a market environment that is conducive for my style of trading? And if it's not, don't trade very much or trade very small. And if you're a bit of an addict like me, make sure you're just trading really small. Make sense? Actually trading and analyzing your results really important. So like the bar by bar sessions, but you can get more reps and sets in quicker with the bar by bar sessions, actually analyzing, actually trading with real money. Personally, I think is important. I'm not telling you to trade. It's not financial advice. I'm just saying, I think it's quite important, especially with emotional control, getting your emotions involved because suddenly something's on the line. It means something more to you. Okay. Then you're going to act a little bit differently. Maybe you don't cut the losses because you can't accept being wrong. That's something that you're going to have to look at and really work on receiving feedback on your trades so that can be from other trade you probably don't want to ask someone that's never traded for feedback on your trades that's probably not going to make going to make sense um, but it could be kind of your trading buddy it could be someone who is much more experienced than you you say hey look these are these are my last 10 trades here's my entries here's my exits what do you think what am i doing right what am i not doing right but also do that with your own trades you can mark them up on your laptop you can print them off if you want mark them up where are you buying what is going on are you potentially buying late? Are you not controlling the risk? Have you got really, um, are you really bad at taking losses? Are you really, really good at taking your losses, but actually you snatch at really small gains? When you print the chart off and you mark it and you kind of see it in the third person, you're going to see your mistakes. Oh, I'm doing this. I'm doing that. Oh, that wasn't actually a very good setup. Why did I buy it there? I missed that. Why did I snatch at that profit when the stock, why did I sell out at 10% and then the stock went up 100%? Why did I do that? I need to put rules in place around that. It's really, really, really important. So a few quotes from Kuala Maggi on deliberate practice, okay? There's two slides on deliberate practice quotes. It's been quite a long section. I didn't think it was gonna be this long a section, but deliberate practice, honestly, so, so, so important, especially if you're a parent with kids. Read the book by Anders Ericsson, it's really key. Yeah, volatility contraction pattern, VCP like Minervini. All the successful traders use the same methods. Minervini, also like Dan's anger and how I trade, it's the same principle because they work. You find a strong stock that's made a big move, then it goes sideways for a while and it gets really, really tight and then it has the next leg move high. It's the same setup. It's timeless setup. It's not going to go away. You can go and look at stock charts from the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 2000s it's the same exact patterns over and over and over again it's not rocket science you guys can pause, pause the video and read the rest of that one it's not a dis discipline problem it's a confidence problem you haven't put in enough effort to build your confidence if you study enough examples of a certain breakout or a certain setup you will build confidence how many of you have spent 500 hours studying one specific setup like thousands of historical examples be honest you have no confidence holding for a big move because but you get shaken out on one downtick. These things happen all the time. You have no confidence 
because you haven't built it. Let me show you one more slide. You've got to study hard. You've got to you've got to outstudy most people and combine it with experience. If you make no trade no trades and just focus on theory, remember that knowledge side, you're not going to be successful. But most people have the other problem. They do no studying and just do random things in terms of trades. There's no real willingness to learn to properly trade. A lot of people think they want to become profitable traders, but most of them aren't willing to put in the effort and the pain that is required. This is the chart setup. But you probably would have known this by now. These are the only indicators you should be using the 10 day, the 20 day, the 50 day moving averages. Anytime you have a clean bounce off one of these moving averages, that's a nice thing. So hopefully you know what the charts look by, look like by now. But here is a visual example. This is what Kali Mangi is saying. The only thing you need on it. I like putting some things on like the RS line, some of the longer term moving averages. But my charts overall, I'd say are pretty, pretty clean. Now we're at the end. So I want to give you six key takeaways. And I would ask if you made it to the end of this video, please do subscribe to the channel to be notified when I do more videos like this. And also press the like button. It really helps me out to grow the channel. It takes a lot of time and effort to build these videos for you guys. So if you do appreciate them, I would appreciate it if you press the like button for me, especially if you made it all the way to the end, which is now over two hours. So well on you. So six key takeaways. What can you actually do, I think, to start improving? Let's go. Study thousands of historical setups from the past 100 years and create your own setup model books. That's an absolute must. It is an absolute must. If you want to take this seriously, that's a must. Be patient with yourself and allow time to develop the required skill set. Remember that golf analogy with the handicap. It's going to take time to build your skill set of golf. You can't just go onto a driving range and start bombing a driver 300 yards. It's not going to happen like that. You've got to build up to it. You've got to require, you've got to build the skill set. No one strategy will perform optimally in every market environment. Sit out power and patience is very, very important to develop. The best strategies create setups, focus on asymmetric risk to reward opportunities and keep you in trends. Even if you're a day trader, on the five minute chart, you need trends. You need trends. You need to sit in the trends. You need the big winners to pay for the small losses. Learn to trade the right stocks for your strategy. That could be if you're a value investor or if you're a momentum trader, you need to be trading the right stocks for your strategy. The best traders are the best losers. As I said at the start, the best traders are the best losers by the quote by Kuala Magi. Okay? Get really, really, really good at taking losses. The better loser you are at this, the better trader you are going to be. And on that note, I will wrap it up there. Thank you very much for watching this video, and I look forward to seeing you in a future one.